Many thanks. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 5276 in the name of Kenneth Gibson on the Finance Committee's report on improving employability. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now, and I would call on Mr Gibson to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Finance Committee. Mr Gibson, 14 minutes, please. Presiding officer, on behalf of the Finance Committee, I am pleased to open this debate on improving employability. This is the second of three consecutive debates I have opened. These things come along like buses. I thank fellow committee members, past and present, for their contributions throughout the inquiry, the clerks, all the witnesses from whom we took evidence, and the participants in our workshops who provided informed and wide-ranging contributions. The committee recognises the vital importance of improving employability, particularly for those on the margins of regular employment. A period of unemployment creates loss of income for individuals, impacts adversely on families, and has a direct effect on government through a loss in tax and revenues and increased benefit payments. Research cited in a report shows that youth unemployment at current levels will incur future costs of £2.9 billion per annum for the Exchequer and £6.3 billion in lost economic output. In Scotland, that equates to £0.2 billion and £0.5 billion, respectively. In 2011, the proportion of 16 to 19-year-olds not in employment, education or training was 12.2%. Scottish Government figures show that this figure has ranged between 29,000 and 36,000 between 2004 and 2011, indicating that this is not a problem that began with the financial crash. The committee focused on how public spending is and should be directed to improve the employability of and create sustainable employment for those furthest from the labour market. Our attention was particularly, though not exclusively, drawn to those between 16 and 24, given the high levels of unemployment in this age group. I now turn to some of the specific areas of our report. Assessing the efficacy of initiatives intended to improve employability, several witnesses ex expressed the view that some programmes may elude the reach of some disadvantaged individuals. A view was expressed by service users, third sector organisations and businesses that this is exacerbated by the complexity of the skills and employment initiative landscape. We recognise that this stems partly from the various levels of, levels of, sorry, the various layers of government involved in supporting employability initiatives. It is important that access to such initiatives is clear and understood. A number of witnesses believe that one-to-one -one support is crucial in assisting those furthest from employment into work. The committee welcomes the introduction of work coaching by Skills Development Scotland and seeks assurances that the programme will be properly funded, available to all requiring it, and be monitored and evaluated to ensure it meets the needs of those at whom it is targeted. Another issue to emerge, both from the perspective of employers and potential employers, was the barriers faced by people living in rural communities. This could include inadequate access to public transport, particularly for those working on sociable hours, and the sometimes prohibitive costs involved. Minerva People Limited said to committee, In rural areas with mainly micro SME businesses, it is difficult finding employers willing to take young people on as some work in se is, is seasonal and transport difficulties arise if working unusual hours, for example, hospitality and releasing staff for training. In terms of rural underemployment, Highlands Alliance Enterprise said, the issue of small and micro businesses is even more acute in rural areas, and some of those areas are challenged by underemployment. People might be employed, but the employment might not be using their skills fully. Those employment might not be using the skills fully. People in rural areas often have two or three part-time jobs to make up a full-time job. Annual funding is another concern, one the Chamber and Government will recall that the Finance Committee has raised before in relation to its work on preventative spend. The committee was very impressed by the efforts of third sector organisations which provide vital training and employability support to disadvantaged individuals. However, the reliance on annual funding could result in a lack of security and uncertainty in terms of the services they could provide over the medium term. Bernardo Scotland said, There are complex funding arrangements for employability services. It is difficult for third sector organisations to develop, sustain and strategically build services and employability when there is no guarantee of funding beyond 12 months. A lot of creativity is involved in making funding work, but if we want strategic progress, we need better funding arrangements for services than, that are shown to work. Again, this was an issue highlighted at our external workshops. We therefore welcome step, steps 
taken by the Scottish Government to encourage public sector bodies to provide funding to third sector organisations over a three-year period. We also invite ministers to consider greater implementation of three-year funding where possible. In consideration of successful interventions, the Committee sought to identify what such interventions do to support disadvantaged people into sustainable employment. A key message was the need to invest time and resources in people. The International Labour Organisation said, It is necessary to keep in mind that people's needs and learning styles are very different depending on their disadvantage. The package of support changes slightly, but the important thing is the training part of it and how to focus it on the needs of disadvantaged people without seeing them as a homogenous group. Well, Who Cares Scotland stated that employability cannot be viewed in isolation for those young people, the most vulnerable of whom are looked after young people and care leavers because they require a package of support. There must be consideration of transitions and whatever else is going on in their lives to ensure that they can engage with whatever course or opportunities we put out there. And for us, the solution is not to fit the young person to the programme, but to fit the programme to the young person. In keeping with Christie Committee recommendations, we noted the importance of ensuring national and local strategies provide a coordinated, joined up approach while reflecting the particular need to assist individuals into work. The Committee welcomes the Scottish Government's continuing emphasis on improving coordination through local employability partnerships, including the co-location of services, along with its commitment to a person-centred approach. Nevertheless, as those fellows from the labour market are not a homogenous group, support should also consider needs such as an individual's health and housing situation and the family and community environment in which they live. The committee was less clear about the extent to which individuals most in need of targeted, multifaceted, seamless and continuous support actually receive it in practice. We concluded that further steps should be taken to ensure vulnerable individuals do not simply fall through the net. I referred earlier to annual funding. I want to talk more about this and the need for long-term investment. As witnesses pointed out, targeted programmes providing a package of support will inevitably cost money, and such support would provide, would provide uh, more support than standard learners, albeit this would be more expensive. Scotland's College has added, The challenge is that the funding methodologies exist to support the average learner. We reckon that the cost of the support that we are discussing is roughly double the cost for a normal learner. That includes staffing and the additional support needed. Who Cares Scotland agreed that a bigger investment is required, where Social Enterprise Scotland noted that, regrettably, such programmes are expensive, but we have to get the right resources. I emphasise that the programme should fit the individual rather than the individual being made to fit the programme. The STC emphasised that the UK spends much less on this area than the best functioning labour markets in the world do, and that successful economies invest heavily over a period of time in the type of active labour interventions that we are talking about. The committee noted that the cost of supporting individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds into employment is likely to be higher, potentially double than the average. The economic cost of inaction to the public purse, the wider economy, society and individual may, however, be far greater. The committee concludes it is crucial to consider the long-term impact of ineffective interventions as well as effective ones. Specific targeted funding, distinct from mainstream employment and employability initiatives, is necessary to support such individuals. This may require a pooling of resources from other portfolio areas which the committee believes the Scottish Government should facilitate. We recognise uh, resources are finite, particularly at this time, but this makes it even more crucial that labour market initiatives, including employability and skills programmes, demonstrate value for money. Many labour market initiatives are measured by their success in assisting individuals to reach a positive destination, such as education or training or employment. Such a measurement can lead to the perception that reaching one or other of these targets is an end in the, uh, to the process in itself, rather than ensuring the individual ultimately finds and remains in sustainable employment. Only by making such a measurement can we be satisfied that such programmes and initiatives are effective. This, indeed. Yes, yeah, Doug Dale. <coughs> well, sir, I couldn't agree with the member more. I wonder, therefore, if he thinks the government should produce sustainable outcome statistics alongside its positive destination statistics, just to look at the difference. Well, Gibson. I have to say I would have no argument against that, to be honest. I mean, I think that the more information we actually have, I think it would be much better to actually track the success of the initiatives that we actually are implementing. 
The Scottish Local Authority's Economic Development Group said quality, sustainable employment should be the outcome of all skills and employment measures. So we need to work back from wherever a young person starts on the journey and be more realistic about funding. If a young person spends three weeks on this, four weeks on that and 13 weeks on something else, they will not build towards sustainable quality employment. The need to engage the private sector more was a topic that participants from the business community and third sector commented on, both at committee and in our employability workshops. We sought to understand how the public sector works with businesses on employability and skills initiatives and programmes and how public money is directed to support this. Comments were made about the range of initiatives and services available from different providers. These may be difficult to navigate for those at whom they are targeted. SMEs face particular challenges. A Skills Development Scotland said, there is a real issue for employers in knowing what is available, how they can access it and when changes have been made. For example, an employer might think that a recruitment incentive is suitable for them, but when they apply for it, they find it has been withdrawn for whatever reason. While well, the Federation of Small Businesses said, small businesses are wary of national schemes as they suspect them of being overly bureaucratic, involving a high administrative burden, requiring significant compromise and cost for the business. The committee welcomes the steps being taken by the Scottish Government to provide clarity of information to employers on such schemes and we also seek confirmation that regular evaluation and monitoring is carried out. We also welcome the Scottish Government's £15 million funding directed at SMEs to support the creation of 10,000 job opportunities while seeking clarity on how this incentive will work in practice. What criteria will be used for selection of SMEs as well as issues around age, eligibility and evaluation? The private sector made clear the importance of consulting and engaging business nationally and locally when designing employability and labour market initiatives. Often, employers are approached only after initiatives were designed, resulting in some not addressing their requirements. This disconnect could mean initiatives may not help either employers or the job seekers they are intended to support. The FSB believe too great an emphasis is placed on financial rewards for companies to recruit additional staff, rather than focusing on actually getting the right person for a particular job. It referred to the then employer incentive initiative and stated, again relating to evaluation, while we support the principle of investment to engage employers, we are not aware of any evaluation of these initiatives' effectiveness. How much of an incentive do they really provide? The committee took evidence from Lord Smith on the Smith Group's recommendations on youth employment. One recommendation was that the Scottish Government should ensure that a strategy is in place that clearly defines expectations of and outcomes for local authorities in employer engagement. This should allow consistency in delivery across 32 local authorities. We strongly feel that the starting point for the strategy should first reflect the imperatives of the young person and employer, followed by local authorities and training providers. Having discussed the private sector, I want to briefly mention the public sector's role in providing uh, employment opportunities to those furthest from the labour market. As Who Cares Scotland said, the fact is that the public sector, which includes the National Health Service and local authorities, is this country's biggest employer and I believe we should look at ourselves and the things we control because we can do quite a lot in our own system to create opportunities for vulnerable young people. Skills Development Scotland referred to a programme of work with the public sector on taking on more trainees and said, the Scottish Government, for example, is engaged with the Get Ready for Work programme and the NHS is desperately keen to be involved more in apprenticeships. However, there are balances to be struck and at a time when the public sector is looking to slim down, taking on staff will be a challenge. The public sector can address this not only in recruitment practices but through procurement with contracts that promote opportunities for young people. During the course of our inquiry, we wrote to all local authorities and NHS boards seeking information on the steps they are taking to offer employment opportunities to disadvantaged people. The responses varied substantially. We recognise, of course, that the public sector is absorbing budgetary and workforce reductions. Even so, we recommend that each local authority and NHS board report to the Scottish Government regularly on their actions to offer employment opportunities to those furthest from the labour market. Presiding officer, I stated at the outset that the committee recognises that improving employability is vital, not only because of benefits provided to those furthest from the labour market, but also in terms of minimising the detrimental impact on sustainable economic growth, the public purse, individuals and communities. The committee is clear in our approval of several steps already being taken with this goal in mind, although there is a need for ongoing evaluation to ensure continuing efficacy. We are also clear on a number of recommendations for action necessary to further address the barriers faced both by disadvantaged individuals and by employers we hope will offer employment opportunities. I conclude by moving the motion in my name and wishing everyone all the best for 2013. Many thanks. <coughs>
I now call on John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary. You have ten minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Could I begin my contribution to this debate by extending my thanks to the members of the Finance Committee and those who contributed towards this inquiry for the detailed consideration that has been given to the issue of improving employability, which is an issue that resonates um, with the Government's agenda. Uh, the focus on the subject is essential as we move towards economic recovery and the delivery of a more prosperous future for all of the people of Scotland. And in the coming weeks, the Government will consider very carefully the, uh, the recommendations made within the Committee's inquiry and will respond formally in the normal way. In the meantime, um, I would like to use the opportunity of this debate to give some uh, reflections on some of the key issues that are contained in the Committee's report and the Scottish Government's position on some of those issues. Could I begin with one very important point which uh, the Convener of the Committee uh, concentrated on in his own contribution and I should also say at the outset that in principle the Government finds the report from the Committee a helpful contribution to the development of this issue and that is why I want to make sure that we take all possible care to respond uh, fully and adequately to the conclusions uh, that are raised by the committee. But one of the points that the committee convener made in his contribution was an important point, and it, it often I think, um, well I think it should be reiterated, uh, because it's often one that I think the public sector is not good at focusing on, and that is the relevance of ensuring that the uh, programmes that are available are not essentially uh, designed in a fashion that they are available for people to contribute, whether they are prepared to contribute or not, but that, in fact, the programmes are designed in a fashion that fit the needs of the individuals concerned, what I would call and what I uh, referred to in my evidence to the committee's inquiry as a person-centred approach, so that we actually take into account the fact that there will be different circumstances and different requirements on every, every, in, any individual that requires some support and employability. In some the cases, some individuals, the support will be relatively modest. In other circumstances, the support may be particularly complex and may in actual fact appear to be the type of support that does not readily uh, subscribe to an employability programme. But crucially is an essential building block in ensuring that that individual can realise their full potential and contribute to the labour market in that respect. So the strategic point that the committee convener makes um, is one that I accept entirely, that we should not operate on the basis that young people or any individuals must fit the programme. The programmes must be designed and our approach must be designed in a fashion to meet the needs of the individuals concerned and therefore fulfil the person-centred approach that the Government intends to take. I'll give away to you. Chairman Dugdale. Like the Cabinet Secretary, I support a person-centred approach, but I struggle to see how that fits with the My World of Work website, which the Youth Employment Minister introduced in December, which is a generic website for all young people. How can you have a person-centred website? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think, I think the, the, the beauty of the, um, the uh, My World of Work website is that it provides young people with an information resource that enables them to make their own judgments. And that is, to me, a person-centred approach. It actually presents as readily as we possibly can do all of the information about work experience, about uh, the whole practice of getting into employment, about uh, information on college, about information about areas of employment, about uh, the practice of employment, to enable young people to make decisions for themselves. I'm sure I can't understand what on earth the debate can be about that in terms of being in somehow in conflict with a person-centred approach. Surely a person-centred approach must reflect the needs and the aspirations of every single individual and the duty of my world of work and the government and skills development Scotland is to present that information in a readily accessible fashion. I'll give away again. Kezia Dundell. If the Cabinet Secretary didn't understand the point the first time round, let me have another go. The point is this website replaces one-to-one -one careers advice. It's a money-saving exercise. It's not designed to improve the support given to young people. Cabinet Secretary. I, think, I, think, I don't think it's me that's misunderstanding anything. I think it's Ms Dugdale who's deliberately, I think, trying to talk down what the government is doing in this area. What on earth could be resistant? about enabling young people 
in the, in, the, in the 21st century, when young people have access to all manner of information and uh, data and ju uh, to make their own judgments, somehow Miss Dugdale wants to uh, get us to operate in a model that um, might have operated successfully in the 1960s or 1970s, although as a as an experienced practitioner of the Careers Advice Service in the 1970s and 1980s, I'm not sure it worked that effectively for me in those circumstances. But uh, the, my world of work is about enabling and empowering and ensuring that young people have got access to all the information that they require to enable them to make their choices. So um, I, I just would encourage Ms Dugdale, in the spirit of new and open thinking in the new year, to perhaps... Uh, replace the tired old record that she's been going on about uh, on that particular question. Um, the government uh, takes, believes that at the heart of the system must be flexibility, due flexibility take into account the needs of every individual, whatever their circumstances. And there will be a whole range of individuals uh, who must be supported by the services that we put in place. So therefore, at the heart of any system must be greater flexibility um, greater choice to ensure that individuals can fulfil their potential. With greater flexibility, of course, can often come greater complexity. And the committee has noted in its uh, views that the basis project, which is um, uh, about ensuring that access to our employment services in Scotland is better aligned, um, uh, is a helpful contribution to trying to improve the uh, way in which services are provided to meet the needs of individuals. The committee has also given um, a welcome to our plans to introduce the Employability Fund. Now, what the work in that area is designed to do is to ensure that we streamline in every way possible the services that are available to all individuals, because the worst thing can be the passing from the pillar to post of individuals who are looking for support within the system. That is why um, the BASIS project has been set up to ensure the better alignment of these services. I also welcome very much the work that is undertaken by the local employability partnerships, which are designed to ensure that in every local authority area we bring together all of the key participants in the provision of employability services at local level, whether that's local authorities, whether that's colleges, whether that's um, the third sector, whether it's the private sector, uh, to ensure that uh, working with the government's agencies and with other providers that we provide the most effective support in every locality we possibly can do. It is also um, supported by the work of the Scottish Employability Forum, which is a joint forum which is um, convened by the Secretary of State for Scotland, by um, the uh, COSLA representative in this area of policy, Councillor Harry McGuigan, and by myself and brings together private and public sector and third sector representatives to ensure that any of the strategic policy issues that may arise out of the fact that different tiers of government are providing different uh, types of service and different interventions in the process uh, is taken into account and that if there are any issues arising at local level which require a policy solution, we can provide timely and effective solutions to bringing these about. Um, as effective as we can, and the forum will meet towards the end of this month. And I look forward to contributing constructively to that process uh, to ensure that any remaining issues are addressed. The committee has uh, concentrated uh, to a large extent in its contribution on issues around um, age limits for programmes. The government has concentrated much of its effort on supporting young people defined as those aged 16 to 19, given the severity of the impact of the recession on young people in this respect. Um, the, the, we took that decision pragmatically, recognising that many of those aged over 18 are often mandated to take part in programmes run by the United Kingdom government. And in the interest of efficiency and simplicity, we have tried to operate in a fashion that respects the areas of programme activity undertaken by the United Kingdom Government um, and uh, take forward those that are under our own responsibility. Um, there are, of course, ongoing discussions about different elements of our provision which are designed to enhance the situation, particularly around the employer recruitment incentive. And I can say to Parliament today that we are considering all options as to the scope of this initiative in relation to the age brackets and age limits that are involved. Um, 
the committee also um, raised concerns about the ease of access to employability support in rural areas in particular. And the government set up in the latter part of 2011 the Rural Employability Subgroup, which is designed to address particular challenges around transport costs, accessibility, the greater prevalence of seasonal employment, um, the greater propensity and span of small and micro businesses um, to ensure that these issues are properly taken into account. And many of the, these points were discussed at the Rural Employment and Skills Summit that was hosted by Argyll and Butte Council in the latter part of last year. Let me, Presiding Officer, in uh, drawing my remarks to a close, make reference to a number of the different component parts of the employability framework within Scotland. No, employment framework, no employability framework in Scotland is going to work effectively unless it properly captures the respective contributions that can be made by the, the, pri the private, the public and the third sectors. And that lies at the heart of the thinking that the government gives to the area of employability and lies at the heart of the thinking around the Scottish Employment Forum, uh, to which I referred a moment ago. Ensuring that our interventions are properly evidenced by input from the private sector in recognising what the nature of programmes and how those programmes will meet the needs of the private sector um, is a particular uh, point of importance. And the government and our agencies go to considerable lengths to ensure that we take forward adequate and effective dialogue with um, private sector employers to ensure that the steps that we are taking as a government and as agencies are focused on meeting the needs of the private sector because ultimately the private sector will create the employment upon which economic recovery is based. Um, as I indicated at the outset of my remarks, I welcome this report, uh, Presiding Officer. The Government will give its recommendations very careful consideration and I will listen with care to the points that are made by members in the debate this afternoon. Any minutes? Now call on Casey and Dugdale. Around six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer, and can I wish you and indeed the whole Chamber a happy and healthy New Year. And first of all, congratulate the Committee on its report. It's not an obvious piece of work for the Finance Committee to do, um, but as Kenneth Gibson said, it flowed from other work the Committee was doing around socio-economics and, and deprivation and inequalities, which is of course great interest to the whole Chamber. And also, coming from the Finance Committee, there is of course a significant focus on the money involved and whether uh, that money is spent in, in a valuable way and whether the results evidence the amount of cash spent. So I think in that sense it's made a very valuable contribution to the debate already. My colleagues Michael McMahon and Elaine Murray both served on the committee for the length of its work and will both contribute to this afternoon's debate. Uh, I know that, like me, Michael McMahon has some serious concerns about the approach that Skills Development Scotland are taking and will talk to those. Elaine Murray will focus on the particular challenges that young people in rural areas face and I know that Minerva people gave evidence to the committee and that such evidence features heavily in the report. Uh, I've been to Dunfries and met with Minerva people myself, as well as a number of young people uh, looking for work in the area. And it was perhaps the best reminder of the need for a, a whole family approach to youth employment. Uh, it's not simply about job creation and skills and employability. It can be about much wider factors, as Kenneth Gibson said, such as transport costs and the heavy reliance on small and medium enterprises to create the jobs for young people in those areas. Minerva also consistently highlight the complexity of the employability landscape and the need for a one-stop shop, uh, an issue which I will return to shortly. Uh, my colleague Malcolm Chisholm will also highlight the work of organisations like Bernardo's Works, uh, another organisation which I have met with recently who do fantastic work across the country. Um, I've been to visit the uh, Bernardo's Works project in Edinburgh and learnt that they have no less than 14 different one-year funding streams to manage. In fact, they have to employ one dedicated fina finance officer just to manage the money. And if you think about the potential that organisation could have to develop and expand its offer, if it had to spend less time looking at spreadsheets and getting the abacus out, then I think we could see the work that they could do. Hans Malik will also speak to college cuts and the impact that they'll have on the uh, employability landscape. Time and time again, President Officer, I hear complaints and concerns from employers about the complexity of the employability landscape. Employers clueless as to what support is available, how to access it, and crucially, unwilling to spend a huge amount of time navigating it themselves. We need to make it as easy and attractive as possible for businesses to take on young people. 
And I know that the government gets the potential that young people have to offer businesses. The government's own Make Young People Your Business demonstrates that. It's no use saying to employers, we have a youth unemployment crisis and it's your moral duty to do your bit. That will pull the heartstrings of some, but it's actually a huge disservice to young people who have the amazing potential to diversify uh, their businesses. But let me try and take these two points together, President Officer, and show how making it easy for businesses to take on young people is a completely different ballgame. Sure. I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll teach you, Mr. Give me. I wonder if she would accept that the whole purpose of the Make Young People Your Business campaign is actually to very proactively sell the business and the economic case uh, of employing young people and that this government has put in place uh, you know, the forthcoming employer recruitment incentive uh, for uh, small businesses, which, if I recall rightly, she welcomed, uh, along also with initiatives such as our skills force. Is it that deal? I very much welcome the Employment Recruitment Incentive and I hope that on Thursday, Minister, we'll hear more about the details of that when we return to youth unemployment again. The issue that I'm about to raise in the story, I'm about to tell specifically about how you get that young person into employment, the actual process of it. And th there's a good story to tell about the Minister's work here, but let me just get to it. There's a company in Edinburgh called Ad Adcentive. They specialise in signage. They're doing really well despite the adverse economic circumstances and have already expanded once. Last year, they took on a young guy called Callum, who was doing a get ready for work placement in Edinburgh. And uh, he thrived in this new environment. He got on really well. He demonstrated a real talent for car wrapping. And if members aren't familiar with what car wrapping is, it's where you literally wrap a car in adverts. It's a growing trend. There's not many businesses in Scotland that are doing it, but there's an increasing demand for it. Callum had a real skill at this, and towards the end of his Get Ready for Work programme, the employer wanted to take him on because he had such a talent for this and such an ability to help the business grow. Several calls were made to different agencies, all of which led to dead ends. The employer phoned Skills Development Scotland, got nowhere with it, and got really very frustrated. I was visiting the company with the local MP, Sheila Gilmore, under another auspice, and it was only because I recognised Callum, having been to Rathbone and met him on his Get Ready for Work programme, that I asked how he was getting on. And the whole story was told about how they couldn't get his employment programme continued and how he was going to have to join the dole queue again in a month's time. I wrote to the Minister uh, and she intervened to her credit and fixed Callum's situation. She made the right ends of skills development Scotland talk to each other and Callum has now got his modern apprenticeship and is thriving. But it shouldn't have taken a government minister's intervention to get to that point. And it's the it's the whole feasibility of navigating, getting somebody from one programme into another, into a job that is crucial. And what the Scottish Government hasn't said so far and that I haven't seen is that pathway from the minute they leave school until the minute they get into employment. Falkirk Council do incredible work here where they do not let their eyes leave that young person from the minute they leave school until they are in a sustainable job. Too many young people are dropping through the net, too many are dropping out of the system. The Minister knows from the visit that we did to Edinburgh City Council in December that Edinburgh are now doing fantastic work in this area with great plans to do more. But we need that sort of strategy coming from the Scottish Government, not just through the own programmes that it manages, but driving that policy, that need across all 32 local authorities. I had a lot more to say, President Officer. I've run out of time, but perhaps we'll come back to this on Thursday when we talk youth employment in more detail. Thanks very much. Now call on Gavin Brown. Six minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I also uh, begin by uh, thanking the convener of the Finance Committee, fellow committee members, our clerks, and in particular all those who gave evidence to the committee in what was an extremely important piece of work, and I think ultimately a fairly creditable report. Um, we aim to do five things in terms of the report. We wanted to look at current initiatives. We wanted to look at how those initiatives were being evaluated. We wanted to look at the relative success of those interventions. Fourthly, what were the barriers to success? And finally, what further action could be taken by government at different levels to try and help with employability of those furthest from the labour market? Those individuals, as the convener pointed out, find it difficult even in the best of economic times. But in an economic downturn, they are almost literally swept aside and find it almost impossible. So it's a critical piece of work. I want to focus my remarks on a couple of elements of the report that have had some um, mention already, but ones where I think there are particular gaps and weaknesses that I hope the government may respond to 
in summing up today, but more importantly, respond to when they uh, give a formal response to the committee in a written format, I think in a couple of weeks' time. And the first one is one of the barriers to success, and something that I think struck me in particular, but I think struck other committee members too, is the essence of single-year funding for third sector organisations. Now, the convener touched on this in his remarks. And in the spirit of, I think, what the Cabinet Secretary called new and open thinking for 2013, I think it's vital uh, that we as a parliament and the Scottish Government as a government get a really good handle on the issue of single-year funding for the third sector. The government, I have to say, have made all the right noises about this over the last couple of years. Mr Swinney said in evidence to the committee, as increasing evidence will show, we have tried for some time now to expand the duration of financial support for third sector organisations. Again, to his credit and to the government's credit, there is a joint third sector statement by the Scottish Government and partner organisations, which states, as a general rule, funders will aim to take a three-year approach to both grant and contract funding. Now, I think most members within this chamber would agree with that as a principle. Where it becomes critical, though, is whether or not those good intentions actually happen on the ground. This was an issue that was raised repeatedly with the committee, usually in private session, I have to say, because individual third sector organisations don't want to get involved publicly on this issue. You can understand why they don't want to upset the council that may be funding them, whether it's single year or not. They don't want to upset the NHS Trust, which is funding them, whether it's one year or longer than that. But it was raised repeatedly to the extent that one group in Dundee, when we had our uh, session there, stated that they were about to issue their annual notices to staff about the risk of redundancy. That was not an exaggeration, Deputy Presiding Officer, but I don't think it's something that anybody in this chamber can feel comfortable about, that a great charity doing tremendous work with those that are hardest to reach, who are finding it most difficult to get to the labour market, have to issue annual notices of potential uh, redundancy. So the intention of government is absolutely right, but the reality on the ground is not synchronised, in my view, with the intention of government. The general rule contained within the uh, joint statement appears to be broken almost as much as it is observed. I note in passing the contribution that the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations, they passed round a, a briefing for this debate to all members, stating very clearly, we would like to note that in our experience, three-year funding is rare to non-existent between local authorities and third sector organisations. SCVO would welcome the Scottish Government examining the reality here and would be keen to work with the Government in any way possible. That was the view the committee took, that we praised the Government for some of the work that it had done, but actually it was quite important that some form of audit, some form of investigation was taken forward by the Scottish Government to look at the extent, or the lack of the extent, of three-year funding actually happening on the ground. Now, I don't expect a full response today from the government. I think it would be useful to know what their initial thoughts are on that committee conclusion and if they do intend to take it forward. But I think it's absolutely vital that when they do report it back to the committee formally, we hear a full and detailed response as to what they intend to do, or if they don't intend to do anything, why they don't intend to do so. Because it was something... I have to say there was the biggest gap between what the government was saying but what the critical third sector organisations were saying to us as a committee on the ground. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, the government is uh, getting a number of things right, but I suppose in the very short time I have left, and I may return to this in closing, is the importance of looking at how the various initiatives, some of which seem to be excellent, how those various initiatives are being evaluated. When money is tight, Deputy Presiding Officer, we have to ensure that every single pound is spent as wisely and pos as possible, and that's something to which I will return later on. Thank you. 
Thank you. We turn to the open debate. Speeches of six minutes, and there's a little bit of time in hand at this stage of the debate for interventions. I call Dennis Robertson to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I take this opportunity to wish all in the Chamber all the best for 2013? And can I congratulate the Finance Committee for bringing this uh, debate to the Chamber? Presenting officer, we're not actually in the bleak midwinter, because in my own constituency in Aberdeenshire West and certainly northeast of Scotland, the opportunities for employment seem to be far greater than they are for the rest of Scotland. This is perhaps due to the fact that we have a thriving energy sector and not wanting to take away from tomorrow's debate on oil and gas, it is mainly the oil and gas and renewable sector that does provide the opportunities for employment. However, there is a realisation, and I think uh, within the finance report, the, the, the report from the, the committee, I should say, there's a realisation that there's a great deal of complexity around initiatives that is available for our young people to get into employment. And this actually is recognised within the North East as well. And for instance, the government initiative, uh, and where I'm uh, aware that there's an £80 million initiative to, um, uh, with spending towards the setting up of the Energy Skills Academy, it's a recognition that we need to ensure that what is available for young people is the right choice at the right time. Uh, and this brings me on to the point with the intervention that Kezia Dugdale had uh, to the Cabinet Secretary. When the Cabinet Secretary was mentioning person-centred approaches, it is quite right that we should have. Let me give you an example, Presiding Officer. Uh, uh, Mr Swinney said that maybe in the 60s and 70s, uh, career choices were maybe not always uh, geared to the individual. Presiding Officer, when I left school, I signed on like many other young people of my age. And when I went to the unemployment centre, they did offer me an opportunity to get into employment. Now, taking the time for reflection this afternoon, I felt like a bit like Norman the Barking Pig, up for the challenge. However, presiding officer, when they offered me a job as a night watchman, or indeed a signer, a paint signer for uh, boats in the dry dock, I felt I had to refuse. I felt that the opportunity for me was even beyond even my expectation and the challenge that I can usually assign myself to. So when we have a person-centred approach, it is to ensure that young people are informed about what is available to them and what they can aspire to within their ability. And that is the essence of person-centred approaches, presiding officer. Within the North East, we are very fortunate because the Energy Skills Centre is there the opportunities for our young people are there. However, there is this realisation that we need to get to our young people at a much earlier age. And in taking the brief from the um, <coughs> Construction Skills for Scotland, they too are looking at trying to ensure that young people are aware of opportunities in various sectors. For instance, presiding officer, in the energy sector, it's not all hard hats and overalls. They're looking for project managers. They're looking for people in catering. They're looking for office cleaners. They're looking for people to provide the skills that keeps that energy sector afloat. Presiding officer, we do have problems within the North East, especially in the rural areas. Because as mentioned in the report from the committee, transport, cost of transport and opportunities are not always the same for people in rural communities. And sometimes it's the infrastructure, for instance, access to the network to ensure that they can get into my world of work, for instance. That sometimes is not available in some of our rural areas. And this is something that actually does need to be addressed. I spoke with the youth minister, uh, oh, not the youth minister, the minister for young employment, perhaps. <laughs> my apologies, minister. <laughs> Just before Christmas, and it was about opportunities for all. And I, and I said to the Minister at the time, Presiding Officer, there is a perception, and it is a perception, that the opportunities for all is perhaps not what it does say on the tin, to take a, to take a phrase from David Cameron from the other day in the news. Because the perception is 
And I say to those perhaps in Remploy who lost their jobs that government sometimes put up barriers. So the opportunities for all by this government is sometimes not realised by the UK government. I actually believe, presiding officer, that we do have to provide opportunities for all in the largest sense, in the greatest sense. And I believe that this government is trying to do exactly that. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. I now call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Jamie Hepburn. Uh, presiding officer, I'd like to congratulate the Finance Committee on another excellent report whose uh, major theme is support for those who are most disadvantaged and furthest from uh, the labour uh, market. I think that's not inconsistent with existing and previous uh, government policy. I was pleased to read the refresh of the employability framework and also, indeed, the, the 2006 document with which I, I, I was associated, as a picture on the front page reminded me. I think in both of those documents, there's a strong focus on reaching out and engaging with those most distant from the labour market, as well as an emphasis on local partnership working, person-centred delivery and employer engagement. What I think has changed more than the policy over the years is the context for uh, employability because at the time of that original document in 2006 we had a situation of serious recruitment difficulties and indeed we had employment academies springing up in Edinburgh for the basic reason that people, vacancies could not be filled. Now, by contrast, we have uh, a 146% rise in long-term uh, unemployment that does not uh, correspond with uh, due respect to my Conservative colleagues over there to a 146% rise in laziness. So while uh, overcoming barriers to work remains at the heart of employability, the sad fact is that there are more external barriers now. Having said that, however, the fact of the matter is that even before the full force uh, of the recession, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation uh, study tells us that there was no evidence of any step change in terms of support for those uh, most disadvantaged uh, in uh, the labour market. And that report, of course, also makes more general points about the general lack of evidence and evaluation uh, of employability policies. And that uh, point, of course, is echoed by the Finance Committee in its report, and I hope uh, perhaps the Minister will take up that point in the summing up about what the Government will do about that, because clearly evaluating, and not just the short-term effects, but the long-term results of these policies is surely uh, of fundamental uh, importance. So then why, uh, why uh, in spite of the good intentions of uh, policy documents of this and the previous Government, have we not succeeded in meeting the needs of the most disadvantaged group. Well, I suppose the first point is the endemic gap between policy uh, and uh, implementation. And I think that's why I particularly welcome the formation of the Employability and Tackling Poverty Learning Network, because I think it's through learning networks like that that good practice can be spread. And that's probably even more important than writing good policy uh, documents. But I suppose the second point is that there simply wasn't a strong enough focus in, the, in both uh, government employability framework documents on uh, the most disadvantaged. And that, that, I think, is where we owe a debt of gratitude for the Finance Committee for being very, very focused in this report and continually emphasising the needs of that particular uh, group. Now, as it happens, as Kezia Dugsdale uh, referred in her opening speech, I have a very good example of a project in my own constituency that does focus very effectively on those who are most disadvantaged and furthest from the labour market, and that is uh, Bernardo's Works uh, at Granton. And I know Bernardo's Works nationally provided evidence to the committee, which I think was generally welcome. But having visited that particular um, uh, site at Granton, I know the excellent work that they do, based on partner partnership, partnership uh, and joined up working in particular with referrers, with support agencies and particularly with employers whose needs they try uh, to meet. But also when I visited that project and read about it, I found out about the one-to-one -one support that is offered, the focus on the most disadvantaged, but, uh, most recently they've taken on a group of care leavers, the way in which they give time to these young individuals and, and don't just restrict it to the normal 13 to 26 
uh, week uh, period. And also, of course, the way in which they don't just focus on the 16 to 19 year olds, but also those who are 19 plus, particularly uh, 19 to 24. So that is really a model uh, project. But as Kezia Dugdell also reminded us, they do have these enormous funding challenges with many funding streams <coughs> and short-term funding that has to be continually uh, renewed. A second example I would like to give is well known to the Minister because I think she pre uh, presented certificates to the Port of Leith Housing Association TOIL, capital T-O-I-L for the official report, a project um, in my constituency which again focuses on those leaving school without qualifications and provides them with training uh, and work opportunities, not just in construction related work as you might expect with the Housing Association but also in other areas such as catering uh, and uh, hospitality. So that is another uh, excellent uh, local example that I have in my constituency. But as I indicated earlier, there are serious external barriers before us now, some of which I've mentioned. I would, it would be remiss of me not also to mention childcare, which is clearly a very serious barrier for many people, particularly women, uh, entering uh, the labour market and notwithstanding the uh, announcement yesterday from the UK Government which will help some better off parents, of course we have low income parents now finding it more difficult to afford childcare because of changes to tax credits and other changes. So clearly the Scottish Government has to do all it can in childcare and I am reminded of an initiative that I was associated with working with families uh, in the past and that was a good example of how uh, a devolved Government could do effective things in helping those seeking work with uh, childcare support. But the final thing I want to uh, raise uh, is another barrier which was raised with me when I visited the Violence Reduction Unit uh, on Friday and, and I hope all members know about the excellent work that that unit based in Glasgow uh, does but um, as it came up in the conversation it was put that employability is also a powerful restrictor of violent behaviour as well as all the many other positive uh, attributes you could attribute to employability but the concern that the co-directors raised with me was that many of the people that they're working with and they're trying to get them into employment are stopped the cause of the PV checks and other ways in which employers will look into the background of these people and they're ruled out for jobs. Now, of course, for some jobs, we have to know what offence has been committed. But I do hope that the government can look at that and ensure that that is only applied where it is absolutely essential because it was put to me by those amazing individuals who I'm sure people have heard of, John Carnick and Karen McCluskey, that that is a serious barrier to uh, uh, ex-offenders finding work and they've, they've now badged this up as a, an initiative called Redemption which may have other connotations for some people but for them it's just saying give these people a chance and at the end of the day that's what employability is all about. Thank you. I now call Jamie Hepburn to be followed by Elaine Murray. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Also, at the outset, can I say I, I very much look forward to uh, future generations of historians looking back at the official report of this debate and wondering what Dennis Robertson was on about when he self-identified as uh, Norman the Barking Pig. Hopefully, they will also uh, look at the, that part of uh, the official report, which uh, covered today's uh, time for reflection to, to get an explanation. It also seems obligatory at the outset of, of any contribution to uh, pass on seasonal platitudes. So, uh, Happy New Year to you, President Officer, and uh, other members. And can I say I look forward very much to uh, next year, 2014, being an even more uh, happy year uh, for uh, Scotland. Can I also in welcoming uh, today's debate uh, reflect that I think this is the third uh, finance committee uh, debate I've spoken in uh, that is dealing with matters that were uh, largely dealt with before I uh, was a member of the committee so I actually hope that I'll get to speak in one where I've been involved in looking at the, the subject uh, uh, matter in some detail before uh, too long but I uh, kind of thank uh, colleagues for the work uh, they undertook in pulling the report together and the evidence uh, gathered uh, over uh, the in inquiry undertaken because I do think this debate as well, I think it's always important for uh, us as a parliament to consider how to support uh, employability, how to better support employability. But I think it's particularly important in a time of economic uh, difficulty. And I think it's important to look at, at the current uh, situation because if we look, uh, to, just to place this debate in a little uh, context, because if we look at the latest labour market statistics covering uh, August to October, we do see that the uh, Scottish uh, unemployment rate actually decreased uh, in that period uh, by 0.6 per cent, which was the, the largest uh, fall since March uh, to May 2008. And we also see that we have uh, a lower uh, uh, unemployment rate than uh, uh, the UK. And indeed, uh, if we look at youth employment in particular, 
uh, in that period uh, it fell by 4.3%, although it is still uh, at 21.1%, uh, uh, just marginally lower than the UK as well. So I, I think I would reflect that at least it is positive that those uh, figures are moving in the right direction, but it does uh, indicate that we do need to consider uh, what can be done to make further uh, uh, improvements. But I do think it is important as well to acknowledge some of the work that is being undertaken by uh, the Scottish Government, because of course we saw uh, in the draft budget uh, the uh, £18 million pounds announced for skills uh, training, uh, which uh, will go towards, of course, the Energy Skills Academy, which I'll leave to my North East colleagues. I think they'll probably want to speak about that in a lot more detail, but also a National Employer and Recruitment Initiative, uh, which will create up to 10,000 uh, opportunities for small and medium-sized enterprises to recruit uh, young people. And that was one of uh, the issues that came through in uh, the uh, inquiry and I've returned to the FSB Scotland uh, briefing uh, for today's debate, they make the point that employment in small firms is the most important route to employment for the unemployed and economically inactive, uh, and set out that the UK labour force survey analysis of movements from unemployment into private sector employment between 2008 to 2011, so that 88% find work in small and medium enterprises compared to 12% in large businesses, but at the same time, 33% uh, of those who responded to an FSB survey felt that whilst their businesses generated enough work to need extra help, only 28% were thinking of recruiting. So I think uh, that uh, funding from the Scottish Government couldn't be uh, better timed. Uh, frankly, and of course, we saw uh, £18 million uh, uh, of uh, uh, investment uh, in 2012-13 uh, uh, on a number of specific uh, employability initiatives, such as the £6 million for uh, community Jobs Scotland delivered uh, by uh, SCVO and uh, Social Enterprise Scotland uh, and the £2.5 million pounds for a, a challenge fund to support uh, the third sector. So it is clear. And I do think we should acknowledge the issues that have been raised about the issue of year-on-year -year funding for the third sector, but it is uh, clear that the uh, Scottish Government is uh, supporting uh, uh, that sector. And of course, we also saw the £9 million pounds, uh, for local authorities with particular youth uh, unemployment challenges. And I very much welcome that because North Lanarkshire uh, uh, was uh, a beneficiary uh, to the tune of £1.8 million. Pounds. I was very happy to join uh, the Minister for uh, Youth Employment at Cumbernauld Airport in uh, my constituency uh, to uh, publicise and highlight uh, that funding. And I think what we heard that day it was that this funding was very important to uh, companies like Cumbernauld Airport and other uh, 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 bodies that are looking for assistance in taking on uh, young people uh, uh, as well. Uh, so it is clear, uh, and there are other uh, measures being taken forward by the Scottish Government as well, but it is clear that the Scottish Government is uh, doing uh, what it can is take for a range of measures to uh, better uh, support and improve uh, employability. Um, can I turn, I want to focus uh, a little on, uh, support, on the issue of supporting uh, those who are particularly vulnerable uh, back into uh, employment. I turn uh, to the NUS uh, Scotland uh, briefing because they uh, highlighted uh, issues around uh, those who are coming out of uh, uh, care. And I think we all uh, uh, appreciate and accept that uh, that is a group that face particular challenges. For example, they pointed out in 2009-10 just 1% of care leavers went uh, on to higher education compared to 36% of school leavers. So they uh, supported uh, the committee's uh, view that uh, these individuals may require uh, more tailored uh, support to benefit from uh, mainstream employability uh, initiatives. And I'm sure we're all uh, concerned about uh, that group of uh, people, and it would be useful to know how the Scottish Government might respond to uh, that particular challenge. And also, like Malcolm Chisholm, I think we also need to uh, reflect on uh, those who struggle with childcare. I was very happy just before recess to host an event with Save the Children uh, here at the Scottish Parliament with a number of uh, parents from across uh, the country, a uh, presiding officer, who were there to tell uh, those MSPs who came to that event of the challenges they face. I know from my own experience the difficulties that my wife and I face in trying to secure childcare. It was nothing uh, by comparison to uh, uh, these individuals. I, I think NES Scotland, and I certainly I, uh, welcome the uh, work that's been uh, taken to improve our uh, child care by the Scottish Government, but again, it would be useful to know what more uh, might be uh, done. So I welcome this debate and I look forward to hearing what uh, the Government has to say in closing. Thank you. And I call Elaine Murray to be followed by John Wilson. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. We hear 
quite a lot about the links between uh, deprivation and, and ill health, and indeed this this morning, between the, the links between deprivation and teenage pregnancy. Uh, but I, even, despite that, I was shocked by the evidence referenced by the Christie Commission that at age 15, the educational gap between the top and bottom 20% of the Scottish population is five years, and it is the widest in developed Europe. That really should be a statistic of shame for all of us who are in, uh, involved in policy making in Scotland, because many of the educationally disadvantaged will suffer cyclical periods of unemployment and underemployment, and will struggle to lift themselves and their families out of the cycle of deprivation. In addition to the loss of income and opportunity to the individuals and their families, this also comprises a loss of potential and productivity to the country as abilities go unrecognised and achievement unfulfilled. The recession is hitting young people particularly hard. Almost one in four young people aged between 16 and 25 are registered unemployed in the last recorded period, quarter for 2012, and that's nearly three times as many as in the same period four years ago. And, of course, these figures do not include all those young people who are underemployed in part-time jobs, some of which can have zero or very little in the way of guaranteed work. Those arrangements may suit employers, but they offer very little financial stability or opportunity for progression for the young people concerned. The Finance Committee uh, inquiry revealed a plethora of initiatives and funding streams aimed at tackling youth unemployment in particular. However, there are questions about how successful many of these initiatives have been in practice and whether they address the problems faced by those who are furthest from employment. And of course, there are also issues about if and how the success of the various initiatives are evaluated. According to Who Cares Scotland and Bernardo's, many programmes are of too short a duration to sustain personal development. And some people require support even to get to the stage where these programmes might be of assistance to them. Uh, Kenneth Gibson also already referred to Minerva People, a, a very successful company uh, in my own constituency, and they described their experience where, whereby one-to-one -one work with young people who are hard to place helped them to identify their skills and talents, and Minerva told us that, quote, these results have been amazing. Now, because uh, Dugdale brought up the criticism of the SDS, internet-based programme, My World of Work, and I don't think the issue, this is not really an issue of just having a go at the government. The problem is that SDS estimate only about 3,000 to 3,500 young people would require additional assistance. That's actually only about 3% of the young people on the, the 60 to 25 age group who require help, who are actually un unemployed. So, you know, many of these young people, of course, they will be a, a, a internet literate. But I question whether more of them might need a bit of personal support as well as that internet, initial internet-based support. And I think also that Dennis Robertson made a very good point uh, about the lack of internet access in some rural areas and some of the more remote parts of Scotland. Minister. Of the, the reform of the career service, I mean, the reason that, that you know, that at the heart of the reforms is to enable uh, our very skilled uh, careers guidance staff to actually work intensively uh, in a one-to-one -one basis with some of those young people uh, furthest removed from the labour market and those young people who are most disadvantaged. Elaine Murray. Indeed, but others, there are other young people who require a degree of support. They may not need the, the very intensive support, but they may require a, a, deg a degree of guidance and support in order to get themselves on the correct uh, programme. Um, I would want to say a bit about rural communities in particular, where employment is dominated by micro and small businesses. On the very positive side, these businesses are often more likely to employ young people with fewer formal com qualifications if their personal attributes and their motivation suit the business. The FSB pointed out in their evidence that small businesses, in fact, represent 93% of the Scottish private sector, and that individuals without degree-level qualifications are significantly more likely to gain employment with small businesses than with larger uh, enterprises. But as the community already said, there are particular difficulties in rural areas, as Minerva people had pointed out, uh, around seasonal work uh, and unusual hours. Uh, one of my own constituents from Upper Nithsdale uh, was offered a, a job in Annan. Uh, uh, he could ex access that job by train, but when it came down to the loss of his benefits plus the train fares, he was only going to be eight pounds a week better off, so he didn't take the job. And there are particular issues also flagged up to us in the Dumfries session around uh, sort of childcare and transport dif difficulties in rural areas, particularly if people might have to work weekends or if they might have to work shift work. So there are particular issues, I think, which need to be looked at. And I think also, uh, I was struck also by the, the difference in perception regarding the efficacy of initiatives in joint working between the public sector and the private sector and the third sector. And it was the private and third sectors didn't feel as included, I think, as possibly the public sector actually thought they were. 
uh, uh, for example, um, the needs of small, and the, co uh, the committee uh, noted this, and the, the needs of small and medium-sized enterprise need to be accommodated in these programmes better if you're expecting these businesses to actually uh, provide training and, and support uh, uh, employment opportunities. And indeed, third sector uh, agencies, which attended the Dumfries session, uh, also felt that they could uh, contribute more to the design of, of support packages. And that was particularly true of, of support for people who are very far from the labour market uh, and need very specialist support. And those could be people like ex-prisoners, for example, or people with addiction problems. Of course, the major problem for anyone who is particularly disadvantaged with regard to gaining employment must be the level of competition they will face at the moment, because employers are less likely to take on someone who requires a lot, the input of resources to sustain them in, in employment when they have a large range of other applicants to choose from. And on the Finance Committee report does flag up a number of issues and suggest a number of actions, but we also have to look at the demand side and how we uh, stimulate uh, employment. Uh, because actually we need to create more jobs uh, as well as help our people to get into them. We actually have to create more jobs in Scotland also. Thank you. And I call John Wilson to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Like many other members, we all have our own experiences with regards to improving employability in the modern workplace and how training together with developing skills impacts on achieving employment. I welcome the emphasis taken by the Finance Committee based on improving employability for individuals, particularly from areas of deprivation. As other members have already stated, this inquiry looked at important areas of employability, namely current initiatives, including modern apprenticeships, evaluation of such key initiatives, and scrutiny of whether such initiatives and interventions are successful. There are good examples of improving employability currently taking place, for example, the partnership between Whitehill Secondary School and Milnbank Housing Association in Deniston, a project that has existed for a number of years and has taken a more formal approach laterally. Milnbank Housing Association has been funded from the wider, the Housing Association wider role funding provided from the Scottish Government. In terms of the detailed responses to the examination of the issues of employability, a significant degree of committee time clearly centred on the need for creating sustainable employment. I was heartened that the Finance Committee scrutiny was not strictly confined to young people, although youth employment is and should be a serious concern for everyone. In its evidence to the Committee, Scotland's colleges quite properly highlighted their unease about 29% of people aged over 24 years old who have no qualifications. Turning to the issue of employability, then the Finance Committee report highlights the elements of success and clearly the factors which do not assist disadvantaged individuals. Some people might say that a higher element of public support and intervention should be required for older people, with the Committee report highlighting accessibility of certain programmes, with even those aged over 20 being excluded. The Committee states that it would welcome clarification from the Government on how decisions were reached on the age limits for opportunities for all and what reason Community Jobs Scotland is only open to 16 to 19 year olds. And I know that the Cabinet Secretary in his uh, contribution earlier in the debate has alluded to some of the reasons why that decision has been made, but hopefully we can examine that in more detail and look at whether or not UK government programmes are addressing the serious issues for those over 19. In terms of developing the Scottish Government's commitment to a person-centred approach, this landscape is complex, and as the report states, this is in no small part due to the split in responsibilities between the UK and Scottish Government. It is clear that the Finance Committee in its report notes a number of different programmes and strategies. Whilst the Scottish Government hopes to address this matter through better alignment of Scotland's employment services, I feel that some of the language used to describe the various strategies and programmes is not useful, and it could be said by some that it does not develop public awareness or a sense of public ownership. Moreover, a key recommendation from the committee's viewpoint was that it considers it crucial that investment in assisting individuals into employment is made with a long-term commitment. The committee, in terms of evidence-gathering sessions, not unsurprisingly, made reference to the number of young people not in education, employment or training. The report notes that the estimated figure of 31,000 in the 16- to 19-year-old age range not in education, employment or training, has remained static for over 10 years now. Some of these issues surrounding employment are out with any government's control. 
you only have to look at the growth in zero hours of part-time contracts being offered by the private sector, particularly in the retail sector. I'm aware over the Christmas period and the lead-up to the Christmas period, a number of retailers were recruiting not on Job Centre Plus, but through Twitter and other accounts to recruit young workers. And the contracts that were being offered to these young workers were, as I've mentioned, zero or five-hour contracts. That is not a welcome sign in terms of young people's experience of employment. And we have to make sure that the employment that is being offered is meaningful. And it does not lead to individuals finding themselves being placed in work that may actually lead to in-work poverty. And we have to ensure that employers take their full responsibility when actually employing people to ensure that they do not find themselves in, in a situation where they are actually worse off, as Elaine Murray indicated earlier in her contribution about workers in rural areas being placed in work which they are actually worse off taking up these jobs than they would be otherwise. In addition, I would also state that a number of my constituents in central Scotland, with its multiple areas of deprivation, are not in sustainable employment, and many may face the prospect, as I've mentioned earlier, of in-work poverty and finding themselves being out of work very easily. The con constituents do not feel, once over 50 years old, that they could find it particularly friendly climate to find employment in the modern working environment. And I have a number of constituents who have approached me uh, regarding their concerns that they feel that they've once again left on the scrap heap uh, after working for 20, 30 years, finding it difficult to find work. As I've stated before, youth employment is important, but it cannot be tackled at the detriment of others looking for opportunities to reskill and retool themselves for employment in our communities. Deputy Presiding Officer, I welcome the report laid before the Parliament and have found the opportunity to debate the report Improving Employability, a thought-provoking one. There is a need to ensure that we have a robust mechanism that evaluates the current skills and employment initiatives so that they are both up-to-date and meaningful to the people of Scotland and for those many people trying to find employment in this modern society. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Roderick Campbell to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I congratulate Kenneth Gibson and the Finance Committee for tackling what is a vitally important and increasingly complex issue. As we know from the latest labour market, market statistics for the period August to October, while unemployment and claimant count numbers throughout Scotland may be down and significantly, regrettably the numbers of those in jobs has also declined. And as we know from Professor David Bell's research referred to in Scotsman yesterday, part-time working continues to rise, and there are increasing numbers of people who are in part-time work because of a lack of a full-time alternative. In terms of assessing employability, it highlights the fact that there may be a substantial financial shortfall, not only to those individuals in part-time employment and their families, but also to the economy as a whole in lost tax revenue. Is this the shape of things to come? Well, I hope not, but I think it underlines the complexity of this issue. Well, what's clear from this and from the high levels of unemployment amongst our young folk and from the evidence of the increasing numbers of 55 to 64-year-olds staying in work is that there are substantial competing pressures across the board affecting employability, as well as, of course, the continuing contrast between areas such as my own constituency and other parts of Fife like Kirkcaldy with substantially differing numbers of claimants and unemployed people. But let's and let's also not uh, also consider the differences between different parts of Scotland. We heard earlier from Dennis Robertson on the situation in Aberdeenshire. So the position is complex. But much more important than the statistics are the real people behind them. Ordinary men and women, including a large number of young people, recent school leavers with standard grades or hires, students with skills and qualifications from college or degrees from university, people with all levels of qualification and skill, as well as people with no qualifications and skill at all, are currently finding it extremely difficult to find work. And as the Scottish Government's strategy for youth employment identifies the human costs of that challenge, damage to self-esteem, a heightened risk of offending, and the prospect of long-term unemployment and the intergenerational social problems that, that can accompany it. There may not be one silver bullet to tackle these problems, but what seems very clear is that there may be too many agencies involved, 
or at the very least that there is a potential for unnecessary duplication of effort between Scottish, UK, local and other agencies. Although the committee has themselves said they haven't undertaken a detailed scrutiny of this issue. What's clear, however, is that the Scottish Government recognises... Uh, yes, briefly. Dennis Robertson. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. We remember also accept that perhaps stereotype uh, images are a barrier to employment in certain areas and certainly in skills where it be energy or construction, that women aren't given the opportunity through education to look at these potential areas for future employment. I, really Campbell. I think the member makes a very sensible point. What is clear, however, is that the Scottish Government does recognise the need to ensure that UK and Scottish employability programmes fit together, and in particular the need to strengthen local partnerships, especially those between colleges, the third and private sectors. Inevitably in this area there is always pressure to establish priorities, but given the academic research of Brinner and Parsons on the experiences of those men who in their late teens had not been in employment, education or training, I think the Scottish Government is right to focus in their opportunities for all programmes on the 16 to 19 year old age group. But we shouldn't pretend or forget they're not substantial needs in the post-20 group, a point I think the committee has taken on board. In addition, other issues such as the difficulties for both employers and employees in providing jobs in rural communities should not be forgotten as other members have mentioned earlier. Whilst I entirely agree with the comments of the Cabinet Secretary regarding the need to set some kind of parameters for initiatives and a necessity to balance focus and breadth for each scheme, there's surely something further that could be done uh, to consider the needs of those post-20. I know what the committee said about Community Jobs Scotland, but anything further that the Scottish Government can say beyond the comments that John Swinney made earlier in debate on the post-20 group would be helpful. With regard to tackling unemployment, while well, internet-issued support such as the world of work, to, or as my world of work, are to be applauded, let's not forget that for many in the employment market who have been out of work longest, internet skill is not great and access is not necessarily easy. If we're to make significant progress in tackling disadvantage, we need to ensure that the needs of the most disadvantaged are not neglected in favour of those for whom a little bit of extra help may be sufficient to assist them into the labour market. With regard to the financing of employment initiatives, the report makes it clear that it's widely accepted that such targeted initiatives are expensive. And I'm sure we all agree that in times of economic crisis, every penny spent needs to be justified. However, as the STUC said, we need to bear in mind that the costs of inaction are even higher. I've no doubt that this is the case, and such schemes can certainly be regarded as a form of preventative spend. But we do need to consider as a parliament how we can best evaluate their success. The committee rightly, I think, recognised that, quote, there needs to be robust, independent evaluation of these initiatives to establish the extent to which they support individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds into sustainable employment. I agree. But notwithstanding these points, let's not forget that we have in Scotland a dedicated youth employment minister, and the government is firmly committed to its programme of modern apprenticeships. It's committed also to using £25 million of European structural funding on supporting young people into jobs. It's committed to better alignment of Scotland's employability services, which would be made much easier if there were full devolution of employment services, let alone independence. So, undoubtedly, improving employability is a vital issue for Scotland. We need to constantly review progress to recognise what works most effectively and to build on that. And as others have said, however, we should never lose sight of the fact that we need to consider employability in the overall context of deprivation. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call Murdo Fraser to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm, I'm grateful to the uh, Finance Committee for uh, this report and for its recommendations, which I read with a great interest. There is obviously an overlap between some of the work the Finance Committee is doing and some of the work being done by the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. And uh, tomorrow uh, the EETC starts working evidence on our inquiry into underemployment, uh, hearing from Professor David Bell, as uh, Roderick Campbell just referred to, some of whose remarks were reported in the Scotsman uh, just yesterday. And much of what is in the report from the Finance Committee will be very helpful in uh, providing a basis for some of the work uh, that our committee uh, will be doing going forward. And it was very interesting reading uh, the Finance Committee's report, how much of an overlap there has been with some of the work the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee has done in the past. I was particularly taken with the section that, that, that was provided uh, on soft skills, because it's a continual refrain 
to members of the EETC, from, particularly from employers, that they get uh, people coming into the jobs market, particularly young people, who might have the technical skills for a job, but perhaps lack the soft skills that they're looking for. And by that I mean the ability to communicate, the ability to interrelate to others in the workforce, uh, the need for a proper work ethic, the ability to turn up on time, to present well, to dress appropriately, and the other things that people might take for granted if they've been in the workforce for a long time. Now, it's fair to say some of this might be overstated, and much of the evidence is, is anecdotal, but nevertheless, it is something we hear from uh, employers. I'm reading some of the evidence to the Finance Committee uh, from companies like ASDA, from Social Enterprise Scotland, from uh, Cruden Buildings and Renewals. That seemed to be a similar refrain that was being uh, heard. Uh, and the message came through quite loud and clear to the Finance Committee that there was an issue with a lack of confidence amongst young people in particular, and that was one of the soft skills that was very difficult to teach, but nevertheless needed to be worked on to a much greater extent. I remember a little more than a year ago when the uh, Economy, Energy and Tour uh, Tourism Committee took evidence on the tourist industry in Scotland. This is an issue that we dug into in some detail. What was, was interesting and, and I think sometimes quite worrying in the tourist sector in Scotland is when you travel to many tourist establishments, you find many of the people working in them are not Scots at all. Many of them are people from Eastern Europe. And when you ask people uh, in the industry why that is the case, very sadly they will say they cannot get youngsters in Scotland interested in jobs in that sector or the ones who come forward don't have the soft skills they're looking for and they can find uh, more enthusiasm, more willingness to work amongst people from uh, elsewhere in Europe or perhaps from Australia, South Africa or New Zealand. Uh, now we have some excellent Scottish companies employing people uh, from uh, within Scotland but it's clear that whole uh, issue of soft skills is one that has to be addressed more vigorously and I was interested to see that within the report. The only way you can get the skills you need for the workforce is actually to gain experience, which is why the whole question of workplace schemes is so important. And there's a lot of good work going on here. I was very interested to see uh, that in Perth and Ross we have a new Property Plus project which is aimed at getting 16 to 24 year olds into work. And this is taking a group of disadvantaged youngsters who have all been through a community payback scheme and are then uh, being put into a paid work programme of 13 weeks, helping repair void council houses, upgrading these properties so that they are ready to take uh, new tenants. And that's taken a group of youngsters, put them under supervision, providing them with, with uh, employment, providing them with training, all the things they need to help get back into the workforce and also providing, of course, the council with an asset in terms of a, a property available to relet that it would not otherwise have. There are currently 15 youngsters in Perth and Ross taking part in that project, another 15 due to join this month, and it's a project being run jointly by the council in partnership with the charity Action for Children. Something very worthwhile, presiding officer, and if a success, something I think perhaps should be rolled out elsewhere in the country. I think we need to do more to develop work experience in schools. I think we've come a long way as a country. When I was in school many years ago, there was no work experience available. It's now something routinely available to youngsters in S4 upwards. But there are barriers to it. We need to do much more to remove some of the red tape. In previous years, I've offered um, work experience, as many other members do, to youngsters from a local school. and That's been taken up, and I've had some, some very good young people coming forward uh, working in my office. But I remember a few years ago, uh, as part of that, being sent a health and safety form to fill in by the local council that ran to a very large number of pages. I can't remember how many it was. It, was 20, it seemed like 20 pages. And, and you know, it was all so, so completely irrelevant uh, that I just refused to fill in. And I phoned up the council and said, look, I'm very happy to take a youngster, but I'm not taking two hours of my life out to fill this form in. And of course, they were very understanding and because of the, the workplace environment. They said that was fine. I didn't need to complete it. But if you can imagine somebody who was a small business you know, a single-handed joiner or a small builder or a car, or, or a car workshop faced with that similar uh, problem, uh, they might well say it wasn't worth their while filling that in and the result would be that that opportunity would be lost. So I think there's an issue around some of the bureaucracy uh, and paperwork uh, around this. Not to say you know, health and safety is not important, but we need to be proportionate in the way we approach some of these issues. And finally, we need to look at the whole question of graduate employability. The University of Melbourne has employability built into every uh, degree, uh, a program whereby students are taught how to market their skills. And I think that's something all universities and indeed colleges need to look at. 
better employer-student relations, looking at issues such as, for example, mandatory CV writing seminars uh, and interview preparation tutorials, inbuilt employability modules such as work experience uh, within degrees. A lot of good work going on already presiding officer places like University of Sussex and Newcastle and Lancaster working with the private sector to develop courses so those coming out are perhaps more ready for the workforce than would otherwise be the case. Well, I, I will members, if I have... Well, I, very briefly, yeah. the members conclude. <laughs> Dennis Robertson. Uh, would the member then welcome the work that's been done in the North East by the universities and colleges to set up the Energy Skills Academy? Marjorie Fraser, please come to a conclusion. Yes, I think the Energy Skills Academy is, 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 is a welcome initiative and I'll be very interested to see how that develops in the, uh, in the coming months uh, and years. Can I say in conclusion, uh, presiding officer, a very uh, valuable report, I hope, like, uh, unlike perhaps some of our parliamentary committee reports in the past, it will be acted on and not just left on a shelf to gather dust. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Joan McAlpine to be followed by Michael McMahon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also congratulate the Finance Committee uh, on its report? I think it's important uh, to remind ourselves, as the STUC reminded the Committee, of the very simple fact that unemployment is caused by lack of jobs. If I can quote from the National Union of Students, the UK Government's austerity policies have been particularly damaging and are responsible for increasing unemployment and the NUS would like to see the UK mount concertive action to create more jobs. I would go better than that, of course, because I believe the people of Scotland are the best people to make all these decisions, and we need the full powers of independence to really tackle the scourge of unemployment. A lot of the talk today has been of person-centred approaches, and I think it's very important to remember that this is exactly what we're doing here in Scotland in our education sector, including our schools where the Child Centre Curriculum for Excellence prepares our young people not only for employment, but also for life. So I want to concentrate on the role of education in regards to employability, uh, which I hope and I'm sure the whole Chamber will agree is, is crucial. Uh, I welcome the budget announcement of an extra £18 million for skills training in 2013-14. Uh, uh, it's over and above the existing commitment to modern apprenticeships and opportunities for all. I was delighted that the Scottish Government has doubled the number of modern apprenticeship starts since 2007 and indeed exceeded its own 25,000 target last year, giving starts to 26,427 modern apprentices. But it's keeping education free for all that we must not take for granted in improving employability not just for graduates, but right across the economy. Our universities are among the best of the world, with a research record far in ahead of our population. They are an economic as well as an intellectual engine, and it's vital that they continue to get the support they've received from the Scottish Government to date. Free access to higher education means that Scotland is bucking the UK trend. Over 50,000 fewer people across the UK started higher education courses this autumn than did so last year, except in Scotland, where university uptake is up, highlighting the benefit of free access. In England, where fees have trebled to 9,000 a year, a drastic drop in people taking places up has occurred, with 6.6% .6 falling, uh, while in Scotland, the number of students is up 0.3%. These figures show that Scotland is delivering far more successful policies and outcomes with the degree of independence we already have in the Scottish Parliament and with the full powers of an independent Scotland we could do the same in all areas currently reserved to Westminster such as employability. A 6.6% uh, no I want to make progress. A 6.6% drop in student starts shows just how much damage UK government's socially exclusive policy is doing south of the border. In Scotland, student debt levels are the lowest in the UK. Figures from the student loans company showed that the average Scottish student loan debt was 6,480, compared to 17,140 in England, 13,650 in Wales, and 15,800 in Northern Ireland. This success does not just apply to universities. I'm delighted that the SNP are protecting 26,300 college students from tuition fees. Uh, the, the 
Conservatives, uh, the Conservatives have been critical uh, of uh, the situation in colleges in Scotland, but I would ask them to look south of the border where college students are paying up to £9,000 for full-time degree courses. The average student at a further education college south of the border in 2013-14 uh, will pay an estimated £6,200, according to the Office for Free Access. Also in the area of education, um, I am very pleased to see that the budget uh, is further investing in colleges, helping to support students and protect numbers. Uh, we're also um, investing in the college estate through our, our NPD programme. There will be £200 million to build a new city of Glasgow College, £100 million in new colleges in Inverness and Kilmarnock. And we've also provided substantial capital investment to colleges in Annie's Land, Coatbridge, Dundee and Alloa. Finally, uh, I, I think it's important to remind ourselves that uh, we, we face unprecedented cuts to our budget in Scotland. And given that fact, the Youth Employment Minister is to be congratulated for the fall in youth unemployment by 4.3% over the year to 21% uh, in the period August to October. I'm sure she'll be the first to agree that there's no room for complacency. But given the restrictions in this Parliament's employability powers, its tax welfare and its powers over the economy, any improvement is a considerable achievement. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Michael McMahon to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy President. Also, I'd like to begin by joining with colleagues in thanking the Finance Committee clerks uh, for their hard work in facilitating the inquiry and producing the report which we are debating, debating today. I'd also like to thank everyone who gave evidence to the committee and made the inquiry such an enjoyable experience. In particular, I found the event I attended in Ardrossan along with the convener very informative and thought-provoking. Coming from Lanarkshire, I was keen to see whether the employment initiatives and skills and training environment in Ayrshire compared more or less favourably with that of the area that I represent. Perhaps not surprisingly, I found that there were many general areas of similarity even where local circumstances may make the specifics quite distinct. It confirmed to me that overall the, the conclusions of the committee's report are applicable across Scotland. But what struck me most and confirmed my own prior experience is that the expectations of the private sector are far too often at odds with the structures for employment programmes designed and run by public sector agencies like Job Centre Plus and Skills Development Scotland. And that's why it's right that the report calls for the earliest possible private sector involvement so that employment initiatives have the best possible chance to succeed in meeting the needs of the business sectors that we will rely on to provide the sustainable economic growth we all desire. A recent meeting I held with a youth training group in my own area highlighted one of the main points raised with us in our drossing, that public agencies are so intent on delivering numbers of people through the system that they too often lose focus on matching the needs of employers with the skills and abilities of those who are looking to find work, especially those who are furthest away from the jobs market. A number of participants in our drawing commented that they would rather have fewer trainees with longer periods in training than lots of people going through schemes in short bursts, only to find themselves devoid of the employability skills needed to make their transition into the workplace more viable and sustainable. This chimed with what I was told in Lanarkshire, where there is a genuine concern that SDS is so focused on inputting large numbers of job seekers that they are not effectively delivering people into the workplace in a sustainable way. Too often it would appear that the SDS identify the outcome they want and then try to fit round small medium enterprise pegs into square training place holes that they have designed to meet their targets but not the needs of the business community. And that's why another conclusion of the committee's report is so important to emphasise. There really has to be much more robust, independent evaluation of current Scottish Government skills and employment initiatives. There has to be evidence produced which will show how employment programmes actually support people into sustainable and valuable worthwhile employment, rather than just counting the number of people who go through the system. Now, often we hear that businesses and government are under intense pressure to become more strategic about developing and assessing employability initiatives and the skill sets that need to be created to meet current and envisaged skill shortages. Business groups claim to be linking strategic planning more directly with training, 
development and recruitment, and while our education and skills system claims to be moving towards skill-based outcomes. And those messages were delivered throughout the inquiry and were delivered repeatedly. And government agencies were identified as being keen on certifying learners' employability skills, be they modern apprenticeships, SVQs or other vocational courses, as a means of indicating that people have been enabled to negotiate their transition to the world of work. But what is missing is the robust evidence we need to be sure that that is actually what is being achieved. And what our inquiry shows is that while employers and educators know that the development of skills is essential to Scotland's competitiveness and growth in highly competitive global markets, they find it difficult to take effective concerted action to establish programmes for delivering them. The evidence is just not there to sustain any uh, argument that that is what is the, the outcome of those programmes. So whether they disagree or not with this opinion, SDS appear to me to be unclear about what employability skills are, how they are connected to one another, and how to approach the process of developing them. And the early problems appearing in relation to my world of work are clearly evidence of this. And while I wouldn't, in general, just attack my world of work, I, I want to see good initiatives being brought forward, and if uh, information technology can be used to enhance the learning experiences of young people. Can I just make this point and then I'll, I'll take uh, your intervention, uh, Minister? I have spoken to careers advisors within SDS who have said to me that their concern is that while my world of work, the, the computer programme, is a tool that could be used, the lack of personal contact that, that now exists means that they fear that people that they used to engage with in the schools directly on a one-to-one -one basis, they are now fearful that metaphorically they will, the careers, careers advisors will be left standing at the school gate hoping to catch those students as they come out and don't disappear down the road, never to be brought back into the advisory service again. So there are problems, and it is not good enough just to say that uh, my world of work is a great idea. It may well be, but when there are problems that are being identified, they have to be addressed. Please. Angela Constance, briefly, please. Uh, I will be very brief, President Officer. I wonder if Mr McMahon would recognise that uh, Skills Development Scotland uh, now work very hard uh, with employers, uh, one, to make sure that uh, a career guidance service uh, gives young people the advice as to where the jobs are today and the jobs are tomorrow, and that the other aspect that uh, Skills Development Scotland have developed in partnership with employers uh, based on employers' needs uh, is our skills force, which is very much uh, about encompassing uh, identify, um, early identification uh, of things such as skill shortages. Uh, I don't Mr. 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 Minister, the point I'm making is that repeatedly through our inquiry, the connection between that, the connection between the, the, the tools that the SDS are using is not being made and there is no evidence that the outcomes are being delivered in the way that you would hope. So from the evidence I heard during the inquiry, that longer term strategic thinking and planning of sustainable long term deliverable outcomes has been sacrificed on the altar of short term target driven results. This inquiry should teach us that lesson and this debate should help convey that message further. That message is what we need to put greater emphasis on. Quality of training over quantity being put through the system with too little or too limited effect. It remains to be seen if the Scottish Government will hear the message of the Finance Committee heard and create the space to deliver the long-term strategies this inquiry strongly suggests we need, and I hope that they will. Right. Thank you very much. Now, Colin Stewart Stevenson to be followed by Hans Alamalek. Six minutes, please. Uh, presiding officer, like others, I congratulate uh, the members of the committee and thank them for their uh, considerable efforts. The focus of the report is mainly on uh, potential in preparing potential employees for work, and in particular those who are most distant from the prospect of early employment. There are perhaps, however, two other factors affecting prospects. One is having control over all aspects out of the economy. The other is a bit more subtle uh, and something we could do something about, and that relates to employers. I've just uh, gone through myself in relation to my constituency office in a recruitment exercise, uh, not of people whom I would describe as hard to employ, uh, but, but it did illustrate something quite important. Um, we had a good quality group of applicants, uh, all of whom were sourced off the uh, website that I run. Uh, we brought five of them in for interview, 
and we had before the interview a 30 minute practical test uh, and the interview then picked up on some of the things out of that and that wasn't quite as straightforward as you might think because it turned out that three of the five people we brought in uh, were unable to commence the skills test because they had neither pen nor pencil in their pocket. And I think that told me something about me as an employer as much as it told me uh, about the potential employees that were now moving to an electronic world. Uh, and am I, as an employer, still stuck in the old world when I'm assessing uh, the qualities in the candidates that I'm going to take on? And of course, when we do take on new people, and others have made reference to this quite properly, uh, we bring in new attitudes and new skills that I think uh, are going to be enormously uh, valuable. Now, the committee has not neglected this issue. At uh, paragraph 184, uh, the committee considers it's crucial that SMEs, who are, are large recruiters, receive appropriate support that enable them to offer sustainable employment opportunities to those furthest from the labour market. And that's picking up on what Minerva said, that few SME businesses will have an HR department or specialist with the necessary skills and experience in recruiting uh, and selecting. I'm glad the Cabinet Secretary, when he responded to that point, uh, made the point that it's necessary uh, to look at a bit of management training for small companies, because I think we've got to look at the recruitment process as well. Because a successful recruitment process is not just simply about ensuring continuity of the enterprise concerned, it's about getting new skills and attitudes uh, into companies and making sure uh, that they benefit from that process, not just filling a chair, but filling uh, minds with new ideas. Um, Kezia Dugdale today, as she did in December, uh, has raised the whole issue of the World of Work website. I've uh, taken the opportunity to go and see if I'm suitable for anything. I find that uh, at my age and with my skill set, there's a limited set of opportunities for me. Thank goodness I got lucky and I got here. Uh, but I think uh, we're underplaying absolutely the role of computers in training and educating people. Kezia Dugdale clearly will not be doing any flying in the very near future. Um, the majority of the first revenue flights that are undertaken by A380 Airbus, the new latest uh, into the fleet, are undertaken by pilots who have never before that first revenue flight actually flown that aircraft type. Because nowadays the computers and the simulators do the whole job. We're moving to a position where computers drawing on the skills and knowledge of a wide range of people delivered through a single access point can genuinely uh, give a set of skills that are much greater than can be delivered simply one-on-one. -on -one. That doesn't, of course, remove the need uh, for one-on-one. -on -one. That remains absolutely important uh, as well. The world of work, uh, the committee looked at and uh, made uh, the, the point was made by SDS that if an individual wants to speak to an advisor, uh, then of course they can do that. But what the World of Work website is doing is actually personalizing the computer experience based on the inputs of the people who, who are using it. And I think to imagine that because you're using a computer, you're, using, you're losing personalization is absolutely to fail to understand uh, how modern computer systems should and do work. Um, the, the SDS also said, of course, what coaches will work with and case manage young people. So it is a hybrid system, and properly so. It should be computers, and it should also be uh, about uh, 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 about uh, the, the, the system. Now, people uh, are going to have to change, employers such as myself in my constituency office, and employees are going to be very different. The, 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 the world will probably see us. Very few people will be using pens and pencils. I don't know when it will be. Will it be 10 years? Will it be 20 years? Will it be 30 years? The evidence is it's happening already. And that is the world into which we need to ensure that people are equipped. Um, 
St. Thomas Aquinas, I think it was, I'm never quite sure who said, to adapt what he said, oh Lord, give me change, but let it not change anything. Um, and that's often the way people feel about things. Finally, presiding officer, the one thing that we haven't mentioned, the one disadvantaged sector that I think it might be worth uh, taking some further effort to look at is getting people who've suffered mental ill health uh, back into work. That's a significant problem in our society, a significant difficult area, and of course people who've suffered mental ill health particularly benefit from getting back into work the social interaction, as well as the financial benefits. Presiding officer. Many thanks. I now call on Hanzala Malik to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Six minutes, please. Good afternoon, presiding officer, and uh, Happy New Year to all. Uh, there can be no pride in the fact that a proportion of our young people are not in employment, education, or training, and has staggered since 1996. Further, therefore, I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate today on improving employability. The Financial Committee's report looks in particular at young employability and talks about those experiencing high levels of multi-deprivation. However, there is a great deal of diversity within this group, and one size does not fit all. It never has, it never will. I wholeheartedly agree with the report's findings that there is a need for a package of support that is flexible enough to deal with a variety of needs young people face today. One issue that I believe should be recognized is the large impact of youth unemployment amongst the ethnic minority young people, with unemployment approximately twice that of the indigenous community. Modern apprenticeships are a good first step to combating this. However, skills development Scotland figures show that visible minority community, ethnic minority communities, particularly in modern apprenticeships, has only 1.2%, which is very sad a figure. We in Scotland need to get our act together and work to reduce unemployment. Hence, the government needs to get out there and find companies who would be interested in investing in Scotland and give our skilled, willing and hard-working workforce an opportunity to prove themselves. Businessmen like Willie Hockey and Glasgow City Council have supported the modern apprenticeship. These efforts are very welcome. They are to be encouraged right across Scotland. And I think time and time again, we fail to recognize the importance industry can play in supporting these issues. We fail to recognize and understand the contribution that is made by many business people out there. And we have never gone out of our way to not only encourage them, but to congratulate them for that effort that they make on our behalf. I would like to also ask the Cabinet Secretary, if the young employment, em, employment policy had been equality impact assessed, it would be interesting to see the findings for that. Many of the schemes mentioned in the report that are focused on school leavers but, and on the uh, school leavers and colleges and people who are dropping out of higher education. However, what it perhaps doesn't do is address many of the other issues in other communities where we still have young people who have perhaps left first-time unemployment and have not been able to be re-employed in terms of their training. I want to remind the Cabinet Secretary of the cuts made to colleges. I know it's a sore point, but it's an important one. And I have to say that there was a shortfall that was recognized. The First Minister had to apologize for that. And whilst I would not wish to ask the First Minister these questions, but I have absolutely no hesitation in asking the Ministers and the Cabinet Secretary 
what are they actually going to do about it? The shortfall that was recognized, are we going to reinvest that in our colleges? Are we going to add it to the next year's uh, budget for our colleges in Scotland? Let's not make that apology a hollow one. Let's actually put that right. Our colleges do a wonderful job. No one has questioned that. Our colleges have done so much in the past and historically. I think it was quite sad that when the Cabinet Secretary suggested that there were some courses that were perhaps not worthy of support. I don't believe there is any college course that is not worthy of support. When people talk about flower arranging is not being an important issue, believe me, you try and get somebody to put a bouquet together for you, you'll soon find out how important that is. There are no jobs that can, there are no training courses that should be undermined. I think we insult our young when we suggest that that's the case. Not everybody is going to be a rocket scientist, but everybody is part of this community. They're part of our responsibility and they're part and parcel of the structure of Scotland. And they have to be supported. And if it means they haven't to go to colleges for courses, that's exactly what should happen. And lastly, providing officer, I really need to say that we as a nation historically have proven ourselves time and time again. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind, and I'm sure anybody else's mind, that our young, given the opportunity, can produce, can perform, and can outdo anybody else. It's a matter of record. I'm not just boasting that because I'm Scottish. It's a matter of record. It is there in black and white. It's there in history. We can do it given the opportunities. Let's do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now call on Mark MacDonald to be followed by Jean Urquhart. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I welcome this debate? Uh, I was a member of the Finance Committee for a large part of the debate, although uh, that was some months ago. But I do think that uh, the debate uh, is, is timely. Um, I think that the inquiry by the committee was timely. Uh, and I congratulate those committee members, past and present, who put the work in to developing the report that we are now discussing today. Can I also uh, extend the uh, greetings of the season and wish everyone in the Chamber a very happy 2013. Um, I think one of the things which comes across uh, both in the report and in the evidence from the, and the discussions that were had in the committee when I was there is that the, the key to this approach uh, is partnership. Um, I don't think any one sector has uh, either a monopoly of wisdom or indeed a monopoly of responsibility in terms of delivering better outcomes uh, and improving employability within Scotland and improving opportunities for young people uh, who find it difficult to get into employment. Um, so all sectors uh, and, and all organisations have to look at what they are doing and what can they do uh, to, to deliver uh, better outcomes. And that's a theme that I think I'll, I'll be focusing on during the course of my speech. Um, I had the, the great pleasure to attend the inaugural Discover Opportunities Awards in Dundee uh, last year um, at the West Park Centre, um, which were there to celebrate the work being done by the Dundee Partnership uh, to try and help uh, get people into sustainable employment. And uh, a number of, of people were given uh, awards at that ceremony for the work that they've done, both as employers and as employees, uh, as a result of the schemes that have been set up there. I think that the Dundee Partnership is doing good work. I think it's something that should be perhaps looked at uh, as a model which uh, could be replicated in other areas. Um, there are other areas, however, which we could look at as well in terms of models. I note uh, from the written submissions uh, the Dundee College uh, put in its case study around its PACE, Pupil Access to College and Employability programme, and spoke about the successes that have been had there. Um, a full-time programme for pupils in their last six months of school and a part-time programme for pupils in their last 12 months, uh, often re-engaging young people who've had a range of complex needs and who have disengaged from mainstream educational provision. Um, it provides 48 full-time and 32 part-time places and is open to young people who are affected by family circumstances, health or disability, social, emotional and behavioural difficulties uh, or the learning environment. And I think that there is a, a crucial element to that which I'll come back to around looking beyond simply the skill sets uh, that we provide people with and looking also at the lives that people lead and the lifestyles that people lead and that uh, I think is something that we also need to look at uh, when we're looking at uh, employability and improving pathways 
to employment for people. And with that, I would uh, like to highlight uh, the example of the Aberdeen foyer, which I know both the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister are very familiar with. I think there is a fantastic amount of good work done being, uh, being done by Aberdeen Foyer. My colleague Dennis Robertson spoke about uh, the buoyant economy of the northeast of Scotland, and that certainly is true in the Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire context. But within that buoyant economy, there are still pockets uh, of deprivation, pockets of problems, and, and pockets of individuals who find it difficult to access employment. And that's why the work that the Foyer does, whether it's through the learning houses which are based in Mr Stevenson's constituency in Peterhead and Fraserburgh, which uh, are, are offering training and support to people who might otherwise not be able to access these resources, whether it's through the Prince's Trust team that the FOI has in place, which looks at providing a programme of individual challenges and teamwork in the community, giving young people aged 16 to 25 a development opportunity, enabling them to develop their confidence, motivation and their skills. Um, it, it, whether it's through the Get Ready for Work programme that the FOIA has designed to assist young people who may need additional support to make the transition beyond school into the world of work, a 26 week, uh, up to 26 week programme. Uh, individuals don't have to stay for the entire 26 weeks. Some of them will not require to stay for the entire 26 weeks. All of these programmes, I think, demonstrate that there is uh, good work being done out there and it's good work that we should be looking at as whether it can be replicated elsewhere. And I think that also, we should look at where uh, community partnerships have a role to play. And uh, with that, uh, I would commend the Aberdeenshire Employability Strategy, which has been br brought forward by a range of organisations, including Aberdeenshire Council, uh, the FOIA itself, uh, and, and others. Uh, and it looks at a number of uh, outcomes that it wants to achieve. And it was very interesting to see some of the, the, the one of the outcomes in particular, which is a reduction in homelessness as they see as being uh, crucial to dealing with employability. And that brings me back to the point about it not just being about uh, the skill set, but also being about the lifestyle. And I think Who Cares Scotland made some of those points around care leavers and ensuring that uh, because of your, if your background, if your lifestyle behind the world of work is chaotic or is problematic or has issues within it, that will affect not just your ability to access employment or to be suitable for employment, but also to sustain employment as well. And that's a thing that we have to be bearing in mind as well as part of this debate, is it's not just, uh, as I think members have mentioned, it's not just about getting people to the stage where they can turn up to an interview and succeed in getting a job. It's about ensuring that they have the ability uh, and the confidence uh, to sustain that employment. And that's why I think uh, looking at, if we were only to look at this as about developing skills, um, we would be missing the point. And I think it's about a much wider societal uh, approach that needs to be taken to ensure that people have a balanced lifestyle, which I think will help them uh, in order to sustain employment once they find it. Many thanks. I now call on Jean Urquhart, after which we'll move to closing speeches. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Although I'm a member of the F Finance Committee now, I was not a member at the time of the Committee's evidence sessions on the issue of employability. However, as other members have attested to, the issue ties in with so many others across our constituency, not least the issue of multiple deprivation. There are some who think that areas of multiple deprivation are located only in urban parts of Scotland and that regions such as the Highlands and Islands are somewhat immune from its worst effects. However, this couldn't be further from the truth, as the government's Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation shows Caithness, Rosshire, Inverness, the Western Isles, Argyll and Butte and Orkney, to name but a few, all contain data zones identified as being in the most deprived parts of Scotland. This is perhaps more alarming, as the index data zones often cover very large areas in rural parts of Scotland and may mask even more acute problems in certain areas in rural parts of Scotland. Uh, in, sorry, acute problems in certain towns and villages. And although the government has produced its own uh, SIMD data map that is useful for examining this, Holyrood magazine recently highlighted a Google map that has been overlaid with the SIMD data for an easier snapshot of deprivation, and I can't recommend that highly enough to colleagues to have a look at. One of the key messages to come out of the evidence sessions, and one which I have much sympathy for, is that it's important to place the issue of employability in a wider context. And as others have also emphasised in this debate, employability is not about getting people into any job, 
It's about finding the right job for the right person and helping to make it as easy as possible for long-term benefits to be accrued uh, and confidence to be instilled in those who have perhaps been looking for a job for some time. In my opinion, this must mean a strong focus on some of the small and medium enterprise sector. Again, in my experience, both as an employee of, a small, business, of small businesses and as an employer, the trust, responsibilities and camaraderie gained through working for a small business can be worth its weight in gold to employees. I believe Highlands and Islands Enterprise were right to point out their work with the Nick Skills Academy and with the Social Enterprise Academy in helping to establish learning and employment opportunities in the Highlands and Islands, as well as their work to support small businesses in the region hoping to grow. Employment can take on many different guises and is not always a direct Monday to Friday 9 to 5 route, and it is vital that we support this from every possible angle. However, I do recognise the issues raised by the Federation of Small Businesses in their evidence session, where they point out that many small businesses often recruit on an informal or personal level rather than as part of any national scheme. And additionally, many employers in my region employ on a seasonal basis, adding another layer of complexity to the debate. In addition to the evidence that the FSB gave, they have recently uh, carried out uh, they're taking their own evidence from small businesses in the Highlands and Islands uh, in, as to the barriers for these businesses and I think it's a, an extraordinarily good read and does highlight some of the problems that we have in overcoming this. Uh, in, conclusion, in conclusion, Presiding Officer, I'd like to thank every organisation that gave evidence to the committee on this topic last year as well as the then members of the committee for their work. And it's vital that this Parliament continues to examine issues like this that affect communities across the country and where, through our actions and attention, we can bring about necessary change. And I'd just like to add a, a comment to uh, Hamza Malik's, uh, I think, criticism of, of the government for challenging the colleges. Do you know, you can't have change without change. And some of the evidence that I have is that when, when you see that some young people have been let down by these same self-colleges, then you have to investigate that and make change happen. And I think that that's part of what we need to achieve here, and I hope that we do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move to the closing speeches, and I call on Gavin Brown, a generous six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think we've had a very useful debate in the chamber this afternoon on the Finance Committee report and weight and experience has been added to that report by individual MSPs who do not serve on that committee but who have brought their own individual experiences uh, to the chamber and I hope uh, that can help the government reflect on its uh, response more formally uh, to the committee. The importance uh, of this issue cannot be, um, cannot be overestimated, I have to say, and in particular, I think Elaine Murray captured the spirit of it very well in her speech when she quoted evidence that was given to the Christie Commission uh, by the Improvement Service. That, of course, is the <laughs> statistic that pointed out the gap between the bottom 20% and the top 20%. And I think the terrifying statistic that the bottom 20% at age 15 are performing as if they have five years less schooling than the top 20%. That sends it out loud and clear, I think, to all political parties across this chamber uh, that there is much that needs to be done, but also that when the gap is as large as it is, it's going to take an enormous amount of effort and time to get meaningful change. That's why the tone of the debate today, I think, was extremely important, because the solutions that we put in place have to outlive the political cycle and probably have to outlive several parliaments if they are to make any meaningful difference at all. I want to return just very briefly to the issue of single-year funding for the third sector, which I focused all of my remarks on in the opening statement. Now, the government, of course, since I spoke at the opening, haven't had a chance uh, to respond to it. But I just want to repeat that I hope they give serious consideration to what the committee has requested and, and to also what SCVO has said in their briefing. With the 
uh, absence now of ring fencing uh, to local authorities, a measure with which uh, I agreed, it's very difficult to the for the government to demand action. But I think by simply shining a light on the issue, um, particularly in a confidential manner so that third sector organisations individually speak up, by shining a light on it, I think we could see a big difference in terms of outcomes and I encourage them to do it um, as soon as they possibly can. Those organisations signed up to the joint third sector statement and I think the government is perfectly entitled to ask why many organisations aren't living up to the ideals of that statement. Another issue that I think was touched on in debate and the report, and one that I think is, is fundamental, is looking at how these initiatives are being evaluated. Again, the government has made the right noises in the relation to this issue. Mr Swinney, at the committee on the 31st of October, said, underpinning all those efforts is an emphasis on getting the best possible value from the range of investments that we make. Evaluation is key. Now, I accept that there is a balance to be struck. Effort and resources you put into evaluation uh, take away uh, time and resource from the front line. And so you don't want to over-evaluate because it can hamper you in terms of what you're doing. But I think from the evidence that the committee has seen, the evaluation at the moment simply isn't taking place. Indeed, the government said, again in giving evidence to the committee, the government has not undertaken a self-standing independent evaluation of all those programmes to then decide whether to continue funding. It is worth dwelling on a quote uh, which Malcolm Chisholm actually touched on. He did not give the exact quote, but he quoted from the same report by the Joseph Rintree Foundation uh, entitled The Impact of Devolution uh, on Employment and Employability from 2010. And they talked about evaluation too, and they said at present, in relation to employment and employability, we can document much action, but little strong evidence of resulting improved access to jobs, earnings and progression in work when compared with a control group. Control group. They implored the government at that time to invest heavily and to look very seriously at evaluation. And the committee, again, I think has reiterated that there needs to be robust, independent evaluation of these initiatives. Money is tight, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's important that we get best value for money that is spent, not just good value. And actually, a lot of the other issues the committee was looking at depends upon robust evaluation. If we're to look at the relative successes of inter interventions, it's very difficult to do that without evaluation. If we're looking at barriers to success, very difficult to do that without evaluation. And looking at what further action could be taken, again, difficult to do that without serious evaluation. The final issue on which I wish to uh, touch in the last minute, again uh, made by a number of uh, contributions over the course of the afternoon, is looking at how we improve business engagement. I think improvements have been made in dealing with businesses over the last couple of years, and there are some outstanding examples of businesses all over Scotland getting involved in a number of these initiatives. But I think there's a slight gap or a slight weakness in terms of engagement with smaller businesses. Now, that's not just the fault of government. It's more difficult, I think, for those businesses to engage because the same person may, be having, may have several roles as well as trying to uh, engage with young people. But the um, quote was put out there, I think, by Jamie Hepburn when he looked at what the FSB had said in their report, saying that there are more businesses who actually could take on young people further from the labour market compared to those that are actually doing it. The gap may only have been about 5 or 6%, but in terms of a difference on the ground that that 5 or 6 per cent could make, I think it's well worth the effort and investment. Uh, I see that my time is at an end, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I shall uh, leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I now call on Rhoda Grant, uh, a generous six minutes, please. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I also... Uh, join other members in wishing everyone in the Chamber all the best for 2013. Um, and I think this was an important debate to start the year with. Um, I found the report extremely useful and I hope it will add to some of our knowledge and understanding of this very important topic. The report rightly points out the cost to government of unemployment with increased benefit payments and also the loss of tax revenues. 
and it also talks about the loss to the economy of lost productivity. And we're also to told that unemployment causes permanent scars, impacting on future life chances. However, for me, the greatest cost is that of, to the individual. The health and impact of unemployment is the same as smoking 200 cigarettes a day. And the impact on mental health and self-esteem is absolutely immeasurable. Therefore, we should not and, and would, should not um, demonise those who are unemployed. It just makes matters worse. We need to look at ways of improving employ employability, find solutions for them. And indeed, if we were to tackle this problem, we could probably also make huge inroads into health inequalities in our country, a problem that has been very stubborn for us for a number of years. The report rightly looks at those who are distant from the labour market. And if I could just touch uh, firstly on one group, and that is the group uh, of looked after children, because they need support beyond their teen, teens. Young people have family support throughout their lives, and we need um, to replicate this where the state is the parent needs to be individually targeted um, and indeed um, I think it was Bernardos who said in their evidence to the report that uh, interventions of periods of 13 to 26 weeks are often not long enough and Scottish colleges also talked about periods of two years but we're actually talking about support and looked after children and has to go on further until they are settled into sustainable jobs um, and able to continue um, in a self-sufficient manner and I think a number of people including Kezia Dagdale made the point that Scottish Government support stops at the age of 19 and um, we're looking at a group of um, young people aged 20 to 24 where numbers of the unemployed are rising, rising in this group so we need to look at those people um, beyond the ages of 19 and especially those who are looked after to make sure um, that they receive our support. Um, others talked about access to childcare and the costs are far too high those who have a family often deal, um, lean on family support for child care. Again, those who are looked after children have none of that support and are often driven out of work if they go on to have their families. And young people who don't have the support of their own families quite often um, start having families earlier to have that family affiliation around them. And we need to try and support them through that and understand why that happens. We need one-to-one -one support. And it's not um, quantity. We need quality um, individual support to deal with complex problems and lots of people um, mentioned those problems like uh, generational unemployment where nobody in your family has worked how can you possibly aspire to work as well um, drug and alcohol abuse the, uh, having a criminal record and Elaine Murray did mention the very stark um, impact of poor education and how that um, affects people at the age of 15 what chance have they got if they're five years behind already. Hanzala Malik also mentioned um, the needs of ethnic minorities which are often ignored and um, Mark MacDonald mentioned homelessness, again a problem for looked after children but a problem for anybody who is facing unemployability. They don't have an address, they don't have a secure lifestyle indeed to get out to work. Um, so all those things need to be tackled as well as the soft skills, the soft skills of being able to turn up to work and um, to know how to interact um, with people that you work with as colleagues and to make that, that relationship work for you. And a lot of people mentioned good examples in their own areas, and I'm just going to mention one in Inverness, and that's Artisans, um, which is a social enterprise cafe. And they, they take people on who are hard to place, who are distant from the labour market. Um, they prepare them for work, they give them skills, but they also give them many of the soft skills about turning up for work, turning up um, dressed properly, um, in, a, in a position that they can begin work. But what the people in Artisans told me was they put in sometimes usual work making somebody ready for employment, but there is nowhere then for them to move on to. And they have real difficulty in creating new places for others coming after them. And that's why I truly believe that the public sector has a role to play in this. And I think it in a point, at a point where um, there are so many people, and people mentioned this in the debate, who are unemployed, people who have had a career path to date, who have confidence, who have qualifications, how can people with special needs um, 
possibly um, compete with them at an interview or indeed job application stage. So we need to look at ring fencing certain jobs within the public sector. Um, the Scottish Government could lead the way. Um, local government health and agencies need to look at ring fencing those jobs that will be specifically set aside for, for people with special needs, giving them a chance um, to have um, good and gainful employment. Um, Another organisation um, that a number of people um, talked about was colleges, and they do have a role to play in reaching the hard to reach uh, people. And it's really disappointing that at this point, where we really need that input, uh, budgets are being cut. And the impact that this will have is colleges will look at prioritising um, where they get the better return for their money. And that pushes uh, the more hard um, to reach out of the picture. Again, having them compete with those who have more opportunities doesn't um, allow us to, to help them. Presiding officer, I'm aware that I may be running out of time, but can I just touch it again on online assistance? And I think a lot of people mentioned my world of work. Can I just say that those who live in areas of deprivation also have areas where they don't have access to IT and online support. We really need to look at making sure that areas of deprivation are not replicated again by government policy, um, where too much is available online and not enough is, is, is put forward um, as, as, uh, in a way that is accessible to people, regardless of where your community is, and indeed whether you have access um, to, to broadband or not. Deciding officer, we need to take steps to make sure that we don't have a further lost generation. And this deb debate, if anything, surely tells us that the impact that this has had in the past, and we can't allow this to continue into the future, and we need to find solutions now. Many thanks. I now call on the Cabinet Secretary, John Swinney, up to 10 minutes, please. Uh, presiding officer, this uh, has been a very important and very informative and very helpful debate and during the committee's consideration of this issue at my evidence session I think I, I don't want to I don't want to put thoughts into his mind but I think I rather surprised Gavin Brown by my response to his question that um, where he said to me if the uh, committee concluded that uh, a different approach had to be taken, would the government take that seriously? And I said to him in response, it goes without saying that I will consider carefully the committee's conclusions in its inquiry. And that's the tone I, 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 I take in this debate. And I thank members very much, genuinely, for the contributions they've made, because how I would characterise the approach that we are taking on the question of employability is that we are, we are part way through a journey. We are, not, you know, we are undertaking reforms and changes because, frankly, we think they need to be undertaken. Um, that involves difficult transitions and changes, and it means that, in some cases, things are not done the way they've been done in the past. And we'll defend our approach on that. But I also want to essentially um, say to Parliament that there is a, a role, which I think has been uh, handsomely contributed to by the France Committee, um, in terms of contributing to the thinking about how we can best take forward some of those um, challenges that we face at this particular time. So in terms of what I say today, I'll try to cover as much ground as I can, um, but obviously we will give substantive thinking to all of the recommendations in the Finance Committee report um, and consider how best we can advance those. And I'll come on to some specific points that colleagues have made in the course of the debate today. Could I begin, first of all, with Mr Malik and his point about um, the, whether the uh, youth employment strategy has been um, equality impact assessed, and it has, um, as, of course, is all of the government's budget work. So there is a, a very thorough process undertaken to assess the equality impact of the budget, and I uh, put a lot of time into that in the preparation of the budget, um, along with the Equalities Budget Action Group, and I'm obviously held to account for that with the Equal Opportunities Committee in Parliament, which again, I think as measures, um, members will observe, is a part of the budget process that the government takes enormously seriously. On Mr Malik's point about whether or not there are ways in which there can be greater participation by um, individuals from our ethnic minorities in some of these employability programmes, the Minister for Youth Employment would be only too happy to meet with Mr Malik and to discuss those questions if he would like to um, pursue that particular approach. Let me now 
approach some of the other more general points that were made by a number of, of members in the course of the debate. Uh, of course, Mr. Mark. And Zala Malik. In that intervention. Um, I welcome that opportunity to discuss possible ways forward, uh, and that, that, that's a very positive move. I also need to say that although the, uh, you suggest that an assessment has been done, it doesn't reflect in the figures, and that's the point I was trying to make. And perhaps with the discussions with uh, yourself in regards to how we can improve that, it may make a difference. Thank you. I think that, that's, that's the, in a sense that's my first point in this debate, that we are on a journey, that we've got to, uh, we, we have got to achieve a number of different outcomes, and some of those will be in relation to the participation of, of individuals from our ethnic minorities, and that, for that reason we're very happy to have that discussion. Uh, Mr Brown concentrated in his remarks on the issue of single-year funding, and it's an issue with which I've got enormous sympathy. I said to committee that I didn't consider it particularly legitimate for people, I maybe didn't use those words, but I'll use them today, that I don't think it's particularly legitimate if I give a three-year budget for people not to be prepared to give some three-year funding clarity to relevant participating organisations. I will obviously look at whether there is more we can do, because Mr Brown's point about the removal of ring fencing um, does uh, remove a certain amount of control, but then I think all of us would agree. I don't think I could, I don't think I could find a sustainable argument that would say giving some, an organisation three-year funding wouldn't be a, a better, more clarifying position of their funding arrangements. It somehow could be outclassed by giving them one-year funding. So I think it, common sense tells us that that would give us a, a better approach in that respect. Second, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, engagement with business, and um, a, my colleague Jamie Hepburn made a number of points in this respect, um, as did um, Michael McMahon. And uh, again, I, want to, uh, I cited to the committee my experience of dealing with a, a company uh, at a National Economic Forum who said to us uh, rather bluntly, um, uh, you know, we don't have time to keep up with all what you lot are on about. We're running a business, and it's a very fair point on behalf of the business. So what we have tried to do is to ensure that the work that is undertaken in the Scottish Employment Forum, the work that is undertaken in trying to simplify and make more cohesive employment programmes, to make them person-centred, actually takes into account that private sector feedback. And I was grateful to Mr Brown for his acknowledgement that he thinks that position is getting better. I would not stand here and say I think it's perfect, but I do think there is improvement being undertaken, and I assure Parliament that that will remain a significant part of our focus. Mr McMahon also um, raised the issue on, uh, about training uh, provision, that there had to be, uh, I think I quote him correctly, a focus more on quality than quantity. And I accept that, and in a sense that is part of uh, my response to Mr Malik's point about uh, some of the college courses. The government has sustained full-time equivalent college provision because we have concentrated on developing the more entrenched programmes exactly in the fashion that Mr McMahon is talking about, because those approaches give individuals a better chance of getting into the labour market if they have developed a more deeply set skills base. So there is a clear linkage between the employability debate and the college reform debate that the government is undertaking, because we are shifting the emphasis of college provision to ensure that we uh, take forward and realise the uh, objectives on quality, um, uh, uh, as uh, distinct from just on quality. Uh, of course. Michael McMahon. Cabinet Secretary for responding so positively to that point. And yes, it was in relation in part to uh, college places, but it was also based on evidence that we heard, particularly in our Drossen, from training providers, workplace training providers, who felt that they were being too restricted in terms of trying to get numbers through uh, workplaces rather than being allowed to work with young people for a longer period of time so that they were more able to then uh, retain those people in the workplace. There may well then be, an, well, the, the, well, I was not saying there may well be, there is clearly an area that we need to examine more fully in relation to training provision to ensure that individuals, if we are to fulfil our challenge, which is the challenge I've set about um, a person-centred approach that delivers better outcomes for individuals, then there may well be a case for looking at some of the issues that Mr McMahon raises, which of course I undertake to do as part of the response to the debate. Um, the question of evaluation has also um, 
been prevalent and I've said that the Government will undertake evaluation work in this respect. Um, we are obliged, of course, in public finance terms to undertake evaluation work uh, to ensure that these approaches are effective and we will endeavour to do so and obviously report as relevant to Parliament. Mr Brown's caveat again that there is a sensible balance to be struck between um, evaluation and the, uh, the overburdening of programmes with bureaucracy, which of course of which we will, of course, be mindful. Um, Malcolm Chisholm, um, I think, made a, a, an interesting a very interesting contribution, but his exa the example that he cited of Bernardo's works, in a sense, perhaps makes my point about some of the very effective approaches that can be taken, where you have, uh, by the nature of the Bernardo's works programme, uh, an approach um, anchored in the third sector, but which is dependent on very strong private sector connections into the bargain. And I think that symbolises the type of approach the Government is trying to encourage to provide long-term continuity and um, substantive support in that respect. Um, a number of points were made about the, um, the, the way in which different organisations contribute into this agenda. It is a complex area of policy. And my colleagues John McAlpine and Roderick Campbell both made, both made points about the fact that uh, constitutional responsibility for these areas of policy is currently divided. And that is absolutely a, a correct assessment of the current situation. What the government tries to do in that context is to work collaboratively with local authorities and with the United Kingdom government. Um, we are, of course, dealing with um, a set of programmes which are formulated at UK level. There may, uh, and there are, in my opinion, strong arguments for us, and I think it reflected in the parliamentary debate, for tailoring those arguments and th th those propositions to suit the needs of people in Scotland. And, of course, to do that, we must have the constitutional responsibility to enable us to do that. And, of course, another helpful aspect of this process would also be for us to be able to, have, to, be able to establish the linkages between benefits policy, taxation policy and employment policies which would allow us uh, to complete some of these approaches which are ne necessary uh, to support the journey into employment for individuals. The Government is under no illusions that for a number of individuals in our society their journey into employment will need uh, a significant amount of support. It needs to be <coughs> tailored towards their own requirements. Dennis Robertson enlivened the debate with a very vivid illustration of why, some, by, of why ignoring that factor doesn't lead us to particularly good outcomes. Uh, so I give Parliament the assurance today that the Government is determined to do all that it can to, to, to improve the outcomes in terms of employability in relation to individuals, that we will work um, effectively in, in reflecting on the Finance Committee's report to make sure that we make the correct judgments about programmes. And uh, I can assure Parliament that um, the constructive tone of today's debate will have a helpful contribution, a form a helpful contribution, in refining the Government's approach, which is in all of our interests to get correct, because if we get it correct, then we will support uh, many of our fellow citizens back into employment and to contributing to the economic recovery of the Scottish economy. Many, many thanks. I now call on John Mason to wind up the debate on behalf of the Finance Committee. committee. Uh, Mr Mason, you have until five o'clock, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. You become more generous every time I stand up to uh, speak. Um, I think uh, on behalf of the committee, it uh, gives me pleasure to close the debate. And can I thank all of those who have studied the report and have spoken today, especially those who had to look at it fresh, who weren't on the committee. I think one of the things that strikes me about the debate today is that there has been wide recognition of some of the problems and some of the challenges that we as a society face. And I think the tone of the debate has been extremely healthy from that point of view. And I welcome, too, the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has promised a formal response to the committee on the many, many points that are raised there. I would like later on to touch on some more of the points that people have raised in the debate, but particularly eh, I would like to mention three things and speak about three things which eh, have been mentioned as well, but I thought I would go into in a little bit more detail. Eh, firstly, the complexity of the landscape, and this has been mentioned by a number of eh, the speakers, including Kezia Dugdale and Dennis Robertson this afternoon, and the convener touched on it in his opening speech. 
And I think, as we acknowledge in our report, part of the problem is that with the various strands of government involved, uh, from the UK, Scottish and local, uh, there can be complexity linked to that. The number of strategies and schemes is considerable, and we identify a number of them in our report. From the Scottish Government, there is, for example, Skills for Scotland Skills Strategy, which I find a bit of a mouthful, the Opportunities for All and its overarching economic strategy. The report notes that Skills Development Scotland is refreshing its Get Ready for Work programme and is working with employers, groups and others over its design content and so on. I'm not exactly sure who all the others are, but a point made in the committee's external employability workshops was whether business in the third sector were being fully engaged eh, by the public sector. And I think that's an area that we want to continue to focus on eh, in the development rolling out of these strategies. A point made eh, in the three workshops which a number of us attended from the Finance Committee was in relation to the various training schemes available eh, and that there seemed to be a certain unnecessary duplication of effort. Too many funding streams and initiatives and too many evaluation processes. As one, participant, as one participant put it, 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 the various schemes are, quote, knock, knocking on the doors of employers, which is causing confusion. Another point made was that there was sometimes an assumption that when new money becomes available, then the public sector will retain that money to deliver the service itself and not look uh, strongly enough to get the private sector involved. A similar point was made at the Ardrossan workshop was that businesses should be allowed to get funding to train, provide training directly rather than funding being allocated to the employment agencies to provide training, which is sometimes not suitable. In oral evidence, the Federation of Small Businesses said small businesses do not have time to look around for opportunities to support young people into employment. And I think the, the importance of small business has been made a number of times this afternoon, eh, including by Jamie Hepburn eh, and others. FSB also said small businesses are wary of national schemes as they suspect them of being overly bureaucratic involving a high administrative burden, requiring significant compromise and cost for the business. But even it has to be said, larger businesses like ASDA have recognised this when they said, we view the current skills and work support landscape as complex as we have, uh, and we have the people in place to deal with it. I do understand the problems that small businesses have in that regard. Uh, this point was reinforced by David Comerford of Mingus Hotels, who said, since January, I have received 20 or more calls from different types of organisations, funding bodies and so on. And as was, as was said earlier, it is really difficult to deal with them all. A company usually has only one person to do that work, and in my company, that person is me. And it has to be said, uh, that is a, a reasonably sized hotel group. I think the committee recognises that the complexity of the landscape is in part due to the split of responsibilities between the UK and the Scottish governments. However, we note that even at a Scottish level, there are a significant number of different initiatives, programmes and strategies. We do welcome the action which the Scottish Government is taking to provide clarity of information to employers. And we are seeking confirmation that these initiatives will be regularly monitored and evaluated. We have also invited the Scottish Government to consider whether a fewer number of programmes encompassing greater flexibility and efficiency might be a way forward. And before I leave this issue, I would like to highlight a further point which came up during our external workshops and which we highlight in our report. At Dumfries, the point was made that uh, it needs to be made worthwhile for employers to actually take a person on for, say, a six-month placement. While at Ardrossan, the point was made that the DWP is not keen on long-term placements as the focus is get on getting individuals into paid employment. At the Dundee workshop, participants suggested that the optimum length of work of time to work with individuals furthest from the labour market is 6 to 12 months and that continuity of contact was extremely important. Uh, the, third, the second point I wanted to go on to touch on, which again has been touched on already uh, to some extent the debate this afternoon, has been on age limits. Uh, the accessibility of certain programmes uh, was discussed during our inquiry, specifically in the context of age. There were suggestions that current employment initiatives were too focused on the 16 to 19 year age group, which often resulted in older individuals, even those aged over 20, being excluded. As the report states, a number of Scottish government programmes likely to be of most relevance to people furthest from the labour market are focused on 16 to 19 year olds rather than the 16 to 24 age group. 
The committee notes the comments of the Cabinet Secretary on the need to have parameters for employment initiatives. And the, the point that he made, I think, was well made about the balance between breadth and focus for any of these programmes. However, we also note the age limits for a number of Sc Scottish Government programmes, which are likely to be of most relevance to those furthest from the labour market, exclude those aged 20 and over. And that, this is likely to include many lone parents returning to work. We are seeking clarification on how decisions reached on age limits to get ready for work and opportunities for all and what reason Community Jobs Scotland is now only open to 16 to 19 year olds when previously it was aimed at 18 to 24 year olds. The committee also noted that the new employer recruitment incentive will fall under the auspices of opportunities for all and suggesting that job seekers benefiting from this scheme might be limited to 16 to 19 year olds. This has also been touched on, I think, by John Wilson and Rod Campbell, and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's uh, comments that he will look at this uh, in more detail. Thirdly, on the question of confidence and other soft skills, uh, this is the third issue I would like to uh, mention at this stage. And it featured again in our three workshops that confidence and building and developing what we might call soft skills or core skills uh, is quite a challenge, and Murdo Fraser also touched on that. At one of our roundtable discussions, Tricia Hunter of Minerva People Limited said, on the other hand, when we have worked one-to-one -one with hard-to-place people to find their skills and talents and nurture just one small bit of what they can do, the results have been amazing. In our debate on the committee's draft budget report before Christmas, I mentioned the session which we held with the David Hume Institute and the discussion around Scotland's human capital while much of that was focused on students and graduates emerging from the higher and further education systems, there is a relevant parallel to draw here. Stephen Boyle of RBS said, the human capital challenge emerges not with more highly skilled people, but with those who do jobs requiring lower levels of skills and qualifications. If I wanted to worry about something in the human capital sphere in Scotland, it would be that. I think that was a useful point to make. The focus of our inquiry was, of course, on those who might be lacking such skills or qualifications. And I would like to draw attention to some of the comments made at our workshops on this. However, I think my time is becoming a little bit tight, so I shall uh, skip over some of that. Because I would like to comment on some of the points that were made. I think some were very useful and some have been touched on uh, already uh, this afternoon. But uh, one or two in particular struck me and maybe haven't had quite the uh, comments they deserved. Uh, firstly, on Hansel and Malik, he did talk uh, again about college cuts, which I think we've heard before. But one of the challenges for the Finance Committee when we've spoken to all the other committees has been if you would like more money for one subject, you really have to tell us where you would like that money to come from. And if it is to be that the universities or whatever have to receive less, then uh, let's hear that. Uh, I thought uh, Murdo Fraser's point about um, work experience is pretty vital. This came up quite a lot in the committee, and I think I'd certainly like to talk about it a bit more on Thursday if I get the opportunity to speak there. Uh, my own niece is at the University of Sussex, which he mentioned, uh, where at least one year often, I think, of a degree course is taken out on really intense work experience, uh, and she, for one, certainly seems to be uh, benefiting from that. Uh, I also just yesterday had somebody in my office assessing my office uh, for health and safety, which took about 25 minutes and uh, I hope was worthwhile for the youngster that's coming to us next week. Uh, I do very much welcome the fact that uh, the Cabinet Secretary is open to new thinking and methods and the quality and quantity, uh, getting a balance in there. And so in conclusion, Presiding Officer, I think this has been a useful inquiry. I hope that the evidence given, the discussions that we held and the report which the Committee has produced uh, will make a useful contribution to improving the opportunities for those furthest from the job market, and I support the motion in the name of the Convener. Many, many thanks. And that concludes the debate on the Finance Committee's report on improving employability. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is decision time and to which we now come. And there is one question to be put as a result of today's business, which is that the motion 5276 in the name of Kenneth Gibson on the Finance Committee's report on improving employability be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. So that concludes decision time and we will now move on to the next item of business which is members' business. And I would ask members who are leaving the chamber 
Now, to do so quietly, please. Thank you.